thank you all for joining us. Today we're speaking about making the move to non-mules. Firstly, I just want to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the country where we're meeting today. I am in Baladong Noongar country um, here in Northern in Western Australia. Um, so the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development acknowledges the traditional custodians of country and the Aboriginal people of the many lands we work on and their language groups throughout Western Australia and recognises their continuing contribution to the land and waters. DPAD respects the continuing culture of Aboriginal people and the contribution they make to the life of our regions and we pay respect to our elders past, present and emerging. So again, appreciate you all taking the time to um, come here today and join us to learn about the process of transitioning to a non mules block. Um, this webinar is aimed at sheep producers who are looking to make the change um, to non mules and will provide some in-depth information around the experiences um, from producers who have made the change already, um, as well as some of the research and extension programs that are available to help you um, find more information and resources. So hopefully it'll give you a better feel of the practical imp implications um, and how they might be managed. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions during the registration process um, that, that they want answered during the webinar. So we've tried to incorporate um, these questions into the presentations that we have today. There will be time for questions after each presenter, and then we'll have a bit of time at the end as well to go through any final questions before we close off. Um, but as you can see, we have quite a long webinar to get through today. So please make sure you've got some lunch or a snack um, and got a cuppa and get comfy. So our first presenter for today is um, Johan Grief. So Johan worked with Deep Herd for a very long time. Um, before officially retiring earlier on this year. Um, and Johan has a wealth of knowledge in research for breach strike resistance. Um, Johan's also joined by another retired research, deep herd researcher, John Carlson, who worked on worm and dag resistance um, and also with Johan on breach strike resistance. And John will briefly say, share some of how he has implemented um, their research findings into his own flock. So, Johan, you should be able to take control of the presentation now and turn your camera and microphone on, and away you go. So, this I'm going to talk to you about a big uh, AWR funded project that uh, was carried out from 2006 up to 2015, and uh, this was on bridge strike. We all know about the reason for the bridge strike issues and the problems that are associated with it, but but it generally acknowledged that breeding is the most long-term sustainable uh, uh, solution. And therefore I would like to acknowledge the people that participate with it. The whole aim of the, uh, of the, of the objectives of the trial was to identify and, quant uh, and quantify important indicator traits for bridge strike in, on mule sheep in our WA environment. And then use this and see how heritable those traits are and whether one can use them as indicated traits to breed indirectly for bridge strike resistance, and that the industry, and if with that information one can develop breeding values uh, that cheap uh, genetics will provide, and that will make it much more easier to identify that in your breeding project programs. So we started off with a strong contribution from the industry. We got 600 use, and we also research station use, but we also had a wide selection of rams and uh, from different flocks uh, across the country that we were very fortunate. Uh, and the focus was very much on bare breach at that stage. And we used this to generate some uh, uh, large variation between, <clears throat> between uh, the animals that we can see what is going on there. And this is the first uh, results from a management position of musing and crutching of what the impact is uh, that on uh, incidence of bridge strike. On the left hand and the y axis is the uh, incidence of bridge strike. And uh, on the uh, <clears throat> bottom is different groups, but it's different management of year groups. The different colors on the left hand side are the females, on the right hand side are the males. 
And if we start with the ones in the middle, the purple ones, you can see this is the incidence of bridge strike over different years of unmules and uncrutched animals. So completely challenged to see what is going on there. And you can see that those, those years on, on average at about 25% were struck. On the, on the right hand side with the green ones, the males, you can see they have about 12, half of them. They've got a, the incidence of bridge strike amongst the males is half of that. If we then look at what is the, if you just crutch it, you can see the brown ones on the right and it comes to females and the blue ones on the right for the males. There's a quite a significant drop in uh, <coughs> yeah, bridge strike. Uh, and so you, showing you how effective crutching is in unmule sheep. But if you mule sheep and uncrutch, you can see on the left hand side that it is, uh, it is also had a significant effect. And if you mules and uncrutch, of course, it's much lower, which was a normal flock and it's about around two or three percent. And that is, uh, shows you how effective mulesing is. But if you don't, you can see the impact. So crutching had a big effect and mulesing had a big effect. The, there's the a very important finding amongst this, uh, from this trial was the large differences between sire progeny groups. Very, uh, within every year at the bottom, there's a, many sires there. And on the left hand side is the uh, percentage struck. And you can see for each year, there were sires that were at, whose progeny had very few strike and other sires whose progeny were very, very susceptible. If you look at this, the third group there for 2008, there was animals nearly 100% of sire progeny groups were struck, whereas in the same group and same management, there are very few. And that is the, the, the variation that exists there between different sires. And in the phase two, you can see there when we crutch them, the, the incidence is low, much lower than the other years, but there was still variation between cyber. And that was a very important message that came out here of the large differences between cyber progeny groups. And it was therefore not surprising that it's a heritable trait. A heritable trait. It's not that strongly, but it's heritable and one can identify or uh, identify animals genetically superior than others. One further thing that came out is that animals with at, uh, that were struck early in life are also most likely to be said but later in life. And that's a very important one. And one of the other things that came out of this uh, whole ex exercise is the relationship between whether animal crutch or mules or uncrutch, whether this is a genetically the same trait. So this slide with that correlations of 0.8 and higher 0.98 shows, it just proves that Bridge strike, whether it is on crutch animals or on uncrutch or on mules animals, it is virtually the same trait. So you do not, there's no excuse for an animal when it gets struck. So the question is at the end of the day, you can't do those sort of things that we've done in our trial. We, what are the indicator traits that one can use indirectly? And so there's a whole range of indicator traits one can look at as DAG, skin wrinkle, urine strain, bridge cover, wool cover, et cetera. So we look at each one of them, and there was a, a, this, a whole uh, uh, booklet with the visual sheep scores that uh, we used to score these animals. And this is for bridge cover, score them from one to five for high coverage, and for wrinkle from one to five for bridge wrinkle, and for wool cover one to five up to yellow, for dags one to five for high dags, number five, and urine stain. And um, one of them, the most significant things that came out here is that DAG score in our environment is a significant effect. Now, this slide is only for animals with the bridge wrinkle score of one, therefore very plain. So wrinkles, also, in spite of the fact that these animals have no wrinkles, they are very susceptible, especially the ones with a high DAG score. So higher the DAG score, the higher the likelihood of being struck. And bridge cover adds a little bit on it. If there's one increase from three to four, it then makes the animal slightly more uh, uh, susceptible to be struck. So that's a very important measure that came in for our WA environment. When you just increase the wrinkle from one to two, one point score in, in our environment, you can see with the animals with a bridge cover score for four, suddenly there's a big increase there. They're much more susceptible. And that's really an important point. So for our environment, then of course, it's, it's, those are the two main traits. And it came out and when you look at all the traits that we have looked at to see what are the factors explaining bridge strike in hogged sheep and uncrutched sheep, unmules, uncrutched, you can see 
there's there's still a lot of information we don't know. That is 61 and 64 percent for use, but the green, all the green there is all the DAG trades that we've measured. That's a real and the brown on the right hand side. That is the 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 wrinkle score. So wrinkleless when DAGs are present, that is the major trait that makes the biggest contribution to makes animals susceptible to pitch strike and wrinkle secondly. When one clutch sheep, then you remove the, the DAX, then you can see there's a big change in rams. We don't know then what is really going on there. It is very small DAX is still there, a little bit of bridge, bridge cover, but 88% is unknown. In the case of use, however, when we take the, the DAX away by clutching, then it all becomes wrinkled, 84% and a little bit of urine stain and a little bit of the others. But those are the pattern. So firstly, DAX and then skin, uh, skin wrinkle. And then after that, face cover and then the other traits. So, but bitch strike, as I said earlier, that is also a very important indicator trigger animal. So there's a concern that animals with less skin wrinkle may be a bit more, or that animals with bridge, uh, susceptible to bridge may be less productive. But that's not the case. This is the slide showing the progeny average groups of uh, incidence of bridge strike and the genetic value for clean fleece weight and then from uh, MP plus, Merino plus project uh, 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 index and dual purpose index and the uh, fine wool production index. So you can see there that uh, there's, there's a spread, very evenly spread, but they are animals for clean fleece weight that are heavy cutters and low uh, susceptibility for bridge strike. The same for the Merino Plus Index. They are animals highly producers, good producers for all over uh, uh, and also resistant. And the same with the dual purpose and with the uh, fine wool. Uh, so they, they, there should be no concern that uh, so bridge strike resistant animals are less productive than others. One further thing that came out here is that there's a, a negative relationship, you know, that with wrinkle score, breech wrinkle score, and lambs weaned per use joint. Higher than wrinkles, the less lambs are weaned. And the same with breech cover. And this uh, support research being done 50 years ago by Helen Newton Turner showing the same trend. So plainer body sheep are more fertile and wean more lambs. So just to give you an indication how we have to challenge the sheep to make them susceptible to strike, this is the, the DAGs that we uh, do deal with in our environment. So you can see this is really a big problem in WA environment. And this information has allowed the industry and sheep genetics to, uh, to, to identify uh, or estimate breeding values for bridge wrinkle, bridge cover, and DAG, which you can use to identify those animals as superior for those traits. And that, that makes it, then you can identify rams, bring them into your flock and improve your flock that way. One thing, those big variation in uh, between high and low susceptible animals within the same year, we really wanted to know, follow that through and to see what actually what's going on and what will happen uh, at older ages with these two groups. Just to show you what they look like, this is the extreme sire groups. You can see um, we all put them together after crutching. They were the short tail to make them more uh, uh, susceptible. And if you can look at them and see, this is the ones on the top left. Only 3% of this sire progeny group was struck, whereas the ones on the top right, 94 and the same uh, big differences that bottom two groups. So there are huge differences between these four sire groups that we took the two highest lows. And we follow these animals through over their lifetime, the ewes. And you can see in Hoggett that when the, the resistant anim animals, only five, uh, so 6% were struck, where virtually 100% of the susceptible animals were struck. And we, uh, we followed them over their lifetime. Now these animals were crutched. So you can see not one single one of those resistant animals was uh, struck in subsequent years, where as quite a significant proportion of use was struck in every subsequent year. So it just shows you bridge strike is repeatable and therefore yeah, they stay susceptible once if you identify them as being susceptible. 
This is another day, a result showing these higher progeny groups when they were exposed one year and the following 2013, 2014, you can see that one in the top right, that one again, both years at the highest uh, number of progeny being struck, highly susceptible. So they breed true, showing it's a heritable trait and that susceptible sheep stay susceptible. We also had a very good look at this, look at what is happening with wax, wind, dust and moisture in the, in the wool. And we were interested in looking at the mid-site wool of that we can use that information to predict which animals will be more susceptible or resistant. But there was no relationship between moisture, wax, dust on the mid-site. But on the bridge wool, this is a, when we look at more closely at what is going on in the bridge wool, we look at different types of fatty acids there, a whole range. And uh, although there was some of them are different, overall, it just shows that in the bridge wool, that the resistant animals had higher, 4% higher total fat than susceptible animals. So that may contribute to making the wool less, uh, um, uh, those animals less susceptible to, to bridge strike. So, one of the things, because these animals get struck repeatedly in subsequent years, there's something unique about these animals so that the flies identify them in, amongst the flock. So uh, we looked at the uh, odor and we trained some dogs to, uh, to see if they can take, uh, identify the wool. So this is a, a dog that has been trained to identify wool samples from struck and resistant sheep. So, uh, Catherine, can you take that? Uh, Those yes. things are from samples in from different uh, sheep, and that is done as well sheep. I can't remember the sink. Uh, 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 and there's some different types of wood in the tongue. Uh, 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 so confusing. I sort of hesitated, wasn't sure, and now then he got it. it but that, that slide just shows without any doubt that there's something unique about the world that the dogs will be able to identify the sheep. And uh, uh, let me just, oops. There's something unique about these and what the dogs identify. What it is, we're not sure. So on the, just to show how effective these dogs were on the samples that they were trained, they were very 100% accurate. They could identify those samples very well. And on a completely unknown blind test of CSRO, our sister trial in New South Wales, they were 82% to identify resistant susceptible animals, which shows there's something unique about the odor that these, uh, these type of sheep have. So we carried out a big, study at the University of, uh, of uh, Western Australia, uh, look at the uh, odors, uh, the uh, using a, let, uh, a machine called the electroantinogram detector. It is basically a gas chromatograph coupled to a mass spectrometer. And that's what you look and you can see there, uh, there's uh, two uh, little uh, thing coming out of the box on the left hand side. And there are two electrodes. If I zoom into that, you can see we take we take that antenna from uh, a fly, and then that antenna is fitted between two electrodes in front of that glass pipette, and then a, a bit of uh, a volatile air or the odor is then uh, uh, flushed past the antenna, and then that antenna, the nerve cells in that antenna still uh, survives, and then, then sparks, and it creates a peak like a, a, the, um, the the cells uh, fires and at the bottom that's the picture of the EAD antenna the, the detector and then that on um, the top part is the mass spectrometer data which is so which chemicals are in that volatile air that you puff over that antenna and then you can line up which the spikes with uh, the uh, uh, with the chemical components and 
then you have an idea what which to which uh, uh, volatile components the, the the nerve cells react to. So we used again in um, 2015 drop we had these psi progeny groups from you can see there's an incidence of bridge strike varies from very low to very high. Just by the way, the one on the right hand side, we've used that ramps every year for a long time and he breed absolute truth and he has massive, his progeny was consistently highly susceptible. So you such a ram in your flock can cause a lot of damage. So we use those on the right hand side and this is what these animals look like. You can see the susceptible animal, 130%. So a lot of them was, uh, was struck twice and some of the sort of three times very susceptible whereas the bottom one this is what they look like and you visually you can't see anything but there's big differences in susceptibility between these things and you can see all these animals a wrinkle score one very very plain so wrinkles there's no wrinkle issues there so this is what we then use and then um, to find out what's the difference between these two groups we will found these sort of uh, chemical components and one of the chemical components was octanol, and that octanol was heritable at 27%. And that's similar to, uh, uh, to milk production, if one selects milk production in general. So there's some opportunities there, but the others are more environmental factors with the heritability very low. So th this, this, one can pursue this and find some additional indicator traits that can contribute to identify animals more accurately uh, to select it. However, there's a, there's a new technology that came around and it is called genomic breeding values. This one is based on DNA and there's some, uh, some what they call SNP chips. This is, uh, these at the bottom, those uh, DNA, those things there, the guanine, adenine, uh, timine, those sort of, uh, they are called the uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. But to see what the difference is there. And that when you sequence the animals, then one can use it to identify genetic animals. The difference between animals. And the this is a routine technology now in pigs, sheep, uh, plants, uh, all over, which use the genetic markers to identify which animals have got specific genetic characteristics. And it is quite, uh, you can, for traits that's hard to measure, one can use that to increase your accuracy. So the, it depends, however, on you need a reference flock. So this is how it works. On the left hand side, one is that, that industry rams, the blue and the pink and the white one, you, they, you generate progeny from them in a, in a normal flock and then the same environmental conditions. And then you measure the animals for the trait of interest. And in this case, if one would do bridge strike, that's what you measure it for. And you take a blood card and you sequence it for the DNA and you develop a, a prediction equation where that information goes in and then you in your own flock, you don't have to challenge animals for the trait of interest. Uh, you can just, uh, the blood card, uh, you just collect the blood card on every animal and then that plug that information on the prediction equation and then it will predict which are the most likely resistant animals that you are looking for. And this is, uh, uh, most of these genes, this is an indication of the, all those genes, many, many markers. There's 50,000 markers there. Each one has got actually a small effect of bridge strike, wrinkle, bridge cover, and DAG. So it is not single big traits there. It is all genes with very small effect that contributes this information. So that is the, the technology that's uh, probably the latest that should be used. And uh, I know maybe Jeff can talk about that later or where they are, but you can see there's some, there's some to say from 22 to about 40% increased accuracy. And that can really help identify animals that is uh, more uh, favorable or genetically resistant to resistance than any of the other ways. So I hope this will give you an indication of sort of what sort of work we've done in the past and where the future will hold. And um, I'm happy to pass on back to you now, uh, uh, Catherine. Oh, sorry. Now I have to pass it on to John. Uh, John, uh, John has uh, John said uh, had applied a lot of these things that we found in his own flock, and he will just uh, inform you of how he went about going non musing in his own flock. So basically, I think in in terms of something that's a little bit different, 
let's probably it for my flock. Um, um, so in the in the youth flock, what I do there, uh, I do flock monitoring if you like, you know, an average count for the flock. So each week before um, I get a mob of youth in, I go out in the paddock and collect some samples. So when they come in, I know what the average is. And even if the average is low, you always get a small percentage that have dags or some other signs of uh, worms. So I collect samples from them and, and do their individual worm make count. And uh, then if they, uh, well, and I record them. So you know, when I do my annual culling, that becomes part of the you culling, if you like, in combination with fleece weight and wet and dry, so that type of thing. So I think I'm probably a little bit unique in that one. So I, I gradually put, you know, shifting the, the the resistance, if you like, you know, in, in the flock. And I, I'm quite uh, happy that I got a very resistant flock now that sort of uh, pretty much uh, stand up to all this sort of stuff, both flies and, and worms and scaring. So I'll, I'll probably leave it like that unless you've got some specific questions. We do have um, a couple of questions that had come through previously, previously and perhaps um, Johan might like to interject as well. So um, one of the questions that came through previously was what data should studs be measuring to get accurate ASBVs to help selection of rams with good traits for a non-mules operation? Uh, thanks, uh, Catherine. I, I think the if one really wants to make genetic progress, then then the most basic things, as I showed you, is dags and wrinkles. Those are the two issues, and bridge covers that can also. So those three, this is what the dag the the stud should be measuring. Now I know it is difficult, and they can't not always uh, expose the animals to what extent that we've done. But if they want to make progress, those are the three. Dags, bridge wrinkle, and bridge cover, and that information then goes in sheep genetics, and that will allow them to provide a breeding value for that. And then one can also then, by being part of sheep genetics, you can then assess and see what other rams are available that you can bring into your flock and improve those three traits. Yes, in addition to that, the one thing I would like to say is on the SAR referencing flocks around the country, if that could be a little bit of a pressure there, you know, so you, you can, you can um, deliberately uh, put a little bit of pressure on, on that trait. So at least and then you have the linkages between the different studs and across the country. I uh, I think they are, they, they some of the ones they do record, especially in WA, they do record DAGs and bridge wrinkle and bridge cover on those animals. So uh, I think that's there. I'm not sure in the eastern states. Thank you. Um, we've got another question to John. If a ewe presents as daggy when the majority of the when the majority are not, and her individual count is low, do you still cull her? Yes, I do. Yeah. Because you know. Um, Actually, I should I should mention that we get basically two types of scaring. It's a high worm account scaring, so you know, you know big numbers and uh, have a low immunity and uh, it translates into 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 dags. But we also get low worm account scaring, which took a little while to recognise. But what happened? That's a different, quite a different trait. It's a it's an autoimmune or hypersensitivity reaction, but like some people will asthma, things like that. So that's the one that uh, probably is the one that's going to take a little bit longer to sort out, if you like, in, in terms of the, the industry as a whole. The, the hardware mechanical scaling should be fairly simple. Just do your monitoring and uh, and, 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 and call any, any of the ones there. But the, the other one, Takes a little bit more knowledge, and 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 that you got to be you got to think about what you're doing. Can I just Thanks. add the? Uh, can I just add the, Catherine? 
uh, it is very important what John just said there, you know, that because DAX <clears throat> is just as much a uh, important trait in its own right as worm as resistant to worms. And therefore, if an animal's got DAX, whether it's resistant or low worm echoes, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an undesirable trait, especially because it makes those animals much more susceptible to bridge strike. We just had another question around what were the factors that impact on fly striker slides. So I think this is perhaps the one referring to um, four factors, although there's five there that impact on fly strike. The uh, fly strike, okay. The top one is just fly strike. Uh, if animals are stuck at weaning and are very early after weaning my flies, then that is a, as a good indicative trait that that animal will be for the rest of his life susceptible, as we our results show. But then the next most important one is DAGs. That's very important to get it away. And when you move, remove that one, then the next most important ones become skin wrinkle. And then after skin wrinkle, face cover or bridge cover, that is the coverage, how much wool is there. But that's not, in the scheme of things, it's not that important. It does make a contribution, but DAGs and skin wrinkle overwhelms the, the all the other traits in, if I can put it in terms of uh, numbers, uh, about 20% of the variation is caused by DAGs and another 20% by skin wrinkles. But if there's, uh, and then bridge cover comes there uh, afterwards, say about around 5%. So, and urine stain, although it makes a small contribution, it is not heritable, so you can't really breed from it, but you can cull visually animals that stained. And because that, although we haven't got information on it, we suspect that may contribute to the animals being come, uh, struck repeatedly in their lifetime. Thanks, Johan. We had another question come in. Um, can we measure wool that dries and doesn't hold moisture that attracts flies? And what can we do to minimize body strike? Yes, uh, we've we've had a look. Uh, there are some people have a look at that, but and because wool are by its very nature is hygroscopic material, and then it attracts moisture. So it is just one of the things of wool, and therefore uh, you can, if you're going to breed for wool that doesn't uh, hold moisture, then it will be not wool anymore because that's really a big part of it. Up to 30% of a wool weight can be moisture if it's uh, as wet, so it is quite significant. So, but we moisture is a key part for the fly to come on. That's certainly the case. But the best thing to do is do something else. One of the things, and we think that's where the wax come in on the bridge, that the wax sort of repels wa uh, water, and is the wool becomes water repellent, and therefore it is much more uh, resistant than normal wool that holds lots of water. Okay, thanks John and Johan. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment, but I'll keep an eye on the chat on the way through and then they might also, we might also have some more questions for you at the end. Um, but thank you very much for your presentation. We will move on now. Um, I'd like to introduce Karen Mutsum. So she's the um, our Deepherds Catanning Research Station Manager um, and oversees the operations down at our research station. Um, so it's a little bit of a different take, obviously, because they're research sheep and there is the commercial flock as well. Um, but um, she's going to go give an overview of um, the station's non-mule sheep and the, the management of those. So Karen, feel free to take over the presentation. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and thanks for the invite to uh, have a chat about how we do things at KRS. Um, so to start with a brief uh, overview of the, our operation here, we have uh, the farm is 2,000 hectares. Um, we do run it as a commercial enterprise um, with a mix of about 75% sheep and 25% cropping. Uh, we maintain a base flock of uh, 3,000 ewes and our numbers can peak at about 7,000 sheep depending on the time of the year. Um, of that sheep flock, 85% uh, of them are merinos and all of our merinos are non-milsed. 
Uh, we're a July lambing operation and we ceased mulesing in 2008. Where we are a little different to other sheep farms is that we're also a research station. So we've currently got 38 trials running on site. Uh, 17 of those are sheep trials and uh, 13 are grain and cropping trials. So Catherine asked me to discuss how we manage uh, both the commercial and the research flocks um, on the farm because they're all of those sheep are non-mulesed. Um, so initially we set a breeding objective for the property, uh, which was to produce a productive, robust, easy care merino with a high reproductive rate and requiring minimal ongoing labour. And I thought I'd start by putting this up because it really became the driver and the direction for all the other things we implemented um, as to how we were going to manage these sheep. And really without, without some sort of direction and drive, we were um, just sort of going around in circles. So how do we do it? Um, the first thing was to identify the risks and, and know your enemy as such. Um, so we looked critically at what type of fly strike we were experiencing on farm uh, and when it occurred. So we know in our flock we see a small number, a uh, small number of breed strike occurrences in April and May, around that autumn time. But the real bulk of our problem um, is in September, October, sometimes through to November, which uh, most with mostly breach strike, um, but a bit of body strike as well. Um, we were already crutching our sheep around April or May, uh, and we were shearing in mid-October. So this was already set in our system, um, and as a routine, every animal was receiving a backline product coming out of the shearing shed um, to cover both lice and flies. So uh, that's all pretty standard and, and nothing really out of the ordinary there. Um, what we did find critical is, is what we did in this lead up here to October, and that made all the difference. Um, so initially we tried just doing a second crutching or a pre-shearing crutch around September, and this was working really well, um, but we ran into a few issues. So the biggest one being shearer availability, um, which is becoming a bit of a problem for, for a lot of sheep producers. So we found that sometimes we were missing that opportunity to get the sheep crutched um, because we just couldn't get contractors on site. So what we've trialled in the last um, couple of years to sort of combat that problem is putting a long wool treatment on the, on the ewes and the lambs when they come in at lamb marking. So the lambs are receiving an application on the cradle to cover them for that um, tail docking and castration wound and the ewes are um, getting an application over the breech to cover them through until shearing time. This has virtually eliminated incidents of breech strike in our ewes um, and really didn't require too much extra work. The sheep were already in the yards for marking, um, so it was pretty easy to just add a spray on treatment before they went out to the paddock. In practicality, um, we found that at that time of the year when we're lamb marking, um, we tend to run out of time and run out of manpower. Um, and so it can be difficult to get our hoggett mobs in to get that chemical protection onto them. Um, so we have the option there to uh, do the pre-shearing crutch for the hoggett mobs only. Um, and that's a smaller number of animals, um, needs we, means we only need to get a shearing team in for one day, which can be a little bit easier to, to achieve. So there is some flexibility in the system there, and we can do either one of those, um, those interventions there to get good protection on the sheep through to shearing. Um, the other thing we're doing in September and October is what we call our pre-shearing classing or scoring. And I'll um, talk a little bit more about what we do there on the next slide. And that's become an important part of our operation. Um, so this ties back into our breeding objective. And we looked at the traits that we could easily measure on the farm um, and that would influence an animal's susceptibility to fly strike. 
So we know that breach wrinkle and dad score will impact on breach strike, whereas our fleece rot, back and shoulder conformation and body wrinkle will have an influence on, on body strike. Initially, we went through and we scored every ewe on the farm, um, which was a massive effort, uh, but it gave us a baseline data set to work with. And now we can just do each hogget group as they come through um, each year prior to their to their hogget shearing. So before they go into the shed, um, they're being scored for fleece rot, uh, dad score and back and shoulder confirmation. Uh, using the, the AWI and MLA visual sheet scores that Johan um, had in his presentation earlier. Uh, and then out of the shearing shed, we're scoring them for um, legs and feet confirmation, uh, body wrinkle and breech wrinkle. Um, we also score our lambs on the marking cradle for breech wrinkle and breech cover, but the scores we're collecting at that hogget shearing are probably more important um, to our strategy and we use those scores um, to create this index um, and allows us to rank our use, which then influences our culling policy. Um, so we cull heavily out of the shearing shed, um, both on our hoggets and on our, on our adults. And uh, we cull all animals that have a breach score um, or a DAG score of five. Um, depending on the numbers that we need to carry through to next year, for both our commercial and our research um, breeding purposes, we'll also cut out the pull out the bottom 10 to 20 percent of uh, of the lowest ranked ewes. There, we also know that any ewes that have been previously struck um, will be susceptible to to um, recurrent fly strikes. So those animals are culled after they've been treated and after they've recovered. Um, a few other things that we found make a bit of a difference. Um, good DAG management, um, so monitoring our worm egg counts and managing the feed base in the pastures can be a big one for us um, so that the sheep aren't scouring because of what they're eating. Uh, docking tails on lambs to the correct length, so those three palpable joints and, and covering the vulva in new lambs. Um, if in doubt, we go slightly longer, not shorter. Um, we are using the conventional tail docking knife. Uh, we've actually found the Tapari knife can be a bit more difficult for some operators um, to handle. We have found it's possible to sort of achieve that a similar bare-ended tail by rolling the conventional docking knife while you're applying it um, and, and achieve a similar result to the Tapari knife with less effort. Um, we do find that we need to monitor our susceptible sheep more closely during risky times. Um, so we're out checking our mobs um, daily during peak fly strike seasons. Um, and we also purchased a new uh, ram team last year, which fit our breeding objective of plain bodied, uh, easy care sheep. So we paid a lot of attention to the ASBVs for worm egg counts, uh, breech wrinkle and dags. But we're not just a normal farm. Um, so we are a research station and we do have some challenges and some constraints. So we host two large sheep projects on site, the genetic resource flock and the yardstick project. And both of those are sire evaluation um, trials. The nature of those means that a wide range of sires are used from across the industry um, and, and those rams can be highly variable because they're representing um, all, all ends of the industry um, with producers that have different breeding objectives um, to us and to each other. So as a result, probably 15% of our lambs um, that are born in, in the research mobs will have we won't suit our breeding objective. So those lambs may have um, high breech wrinkle, high body wrinkle, um, high breech cover, DAG score, and they may be more susceptible to worm burdens. Um, so if they were in our commercial mobs, they would be culled out, but those animals are important to the research projects, so they need to stay on farm. Um, similarly, we have some ewes that may have been treated and recovered from fly strike. 
um, or are prone to fleece rot, dags, and ordinarily, ordinarily we would like to cull those ewes out, um, but they're on trial, so they need to remain for research purposes. Um, the other large part of, of these trials we do is uh, we generate a lot of data um, for worm egg count ASBVs. Um, so that means at certain times of the year, we actually need to let our research lambs develop a moderate, moderate worm burden. Um, this means that not only are those lambs themselves um, at higher risk of fly strike for a short period of time if they become daggy. It also means that when we're looking at the rams that we select for our commercial flock, because our the ewe progeny from our commercial flock become our base ewe flock for the research trials, we actually can't select too heavily for worm resistance in our sires. Otherwise, we won't be able to generate that data in the research lambs. Um, what that means for us is that we need to identify those more susceptible animals um, and they may need additional monitoring and they might need some, some extra individual treatments. Um, so just to finish off with a summary of, of what we do and what we've found, we're shearing once a year and cr crutching once or twice a year um, with two chemical applications, but my, I think my biggest take home message is that we've really not made any huge or drastic changes to the system. We've just refined it and we've just added in little pieces here and there um, that all come together to, to work for us. Um, we've had to take multiple approaches in both husbandry and genetics and, and we're relying heavily on, um, on classing our sheep and selecting for sheep which should be more, more resistant and removing those animals um, which are more susceptible to fly strike. Um, and where we can't do this for uh, because of research purposes, we have to um, increase our monitoring of those animals. Um, and I'd just like to uh, finish by thanking uh, Catherine for the opportunity to present and uh, just added in a couple of the tools that we find useful. Um, in helping us manage our non-mules merinos. So Flyboss uh, is a great tool for um, looking at the st uh, determining strategies for how to manage your, your sheep. And Ag360 is great for um, predicting and alerting us to, uh, to higher fly strike um, risks and times of the year. So thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Karen. Great presentation. Um, we've got a question on the chat. What chemical at landmarking for the use breaches? We're using Click for that. And another one around um, classing and scoring. Do you do that all yourself or do you have other people from outside come in to help with the classing? At this stage, we do most of that ourselves. Can you please repeat the chemical? I think it was click. Click, correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions we've got at the moment, unless anyone else is furiously typing away. Um, thanks so much, Karen, for the presentation. Um, it's great to hear what's going on there. Um, I will take control back of the presentation and we will move on to hear from um, our producers who are online today. Um, so they're going to give us a bit more of a perspective around their actual transition to um, non-mules and what that looked for like for them. And then also some of the lessons that they have learned along the way as well. Um, so the first one is Thomas Pangilly. So he farms with his family down um, near Cascade and they also have a pole merino stud. So they've had a bit of a journey to um, get to non mills So he'll share that um, and his top tips as well. Feel free to take control of that presentation and away you go. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Catherine, for the opportunity to um, present today. Um, we're quite passionate about um, 
what it is to moving into non-mules um, and educating where possible people into taking that leap. It's something that, that's, um, yeah, we found quite rewarding. So today I'm going to talk to you about our journey along the way. Um, going to go over who we are, the timeline for our journey, um, the welfare concerns that we've had along the way, how we've done genetic solutions, our management change, proof of the practices that we use, um, and any lessons that we've learned along the way. So to start off, um, I'm part of a family operated Palmerino flock called Penrose Pastoral. Uh, we run between 1800 and 2000 breeding ewes over our combined 393,000 hectare property. Um, so that's three different properties. As you can see on the top left, um, we do a little bit of road work, getting the sheep in between each way. Um, we're predominantly a 60-40 cropping to livestock mix in about a 300 mil annual rainfall. Um, and that leaves us over winter around 1,600 hectares to winter graze. Um, our pastures are predominantly medic, cerradella, vetch and rye. Um, however, we will graze crops when the season requires it. So our journey so far. Um, we had a really tough year back in 2007-2008, um, really dry summer that led on for a long period of time. Um, and that led us to having like lambing down pretty much with not a lot of feed at all. Um, and it made us take the jump into non-musing that 2008 drop, um, pretty much trying to reduce stress on the lambs. Um, that was then followed up in 2010, um, where we started looking, well, we're already on the path to breeding a planar animal, um, but it's where we really started aiming at breach and wrinkle um, scores and just phenotype traits um, in our animals that headed us further along the path to going non-mules. Um, we did manage to um, non-mules our rams, sale rams in 2010, um, which led to unfortunately um, a reduced sale potential in 2011 um, because the buyer wasn't prepared for how to manage unmule sheep. Um, but after a couple more breeding practices, um, 2016 came round and we felt that uh, sheep were in a position that we could um, actually start or stop musing um, our weathers again. And our ewes were in a position that we were happy to just tail strip, if not like a very, very minimal mules. Um, we actually ceased mulesing all up in 2019. Um, and in 2020, we took the next step into um, some of the schemes, in particular RWS for us. Um, so as you can see, our journey, we were off and on for the first five years um, for varying reasons, but it's pretty much taken us eight to 10 years to get to the full journey. Um, if you really push the wagon, you can probably do it in five years, but you've you've really got to be on the ball um, to attempt to get that sort of timeline. Um, ten years between five and ten years is probably a nice um, genetically relaxed timeline. So we'll start off with the welfare concerns that we've had. Um, Obviously, welfare was brought to the market attention in 2004 with the idea to end mulesing by 2010. Um, in all honesty, back in that time period, we were not ready. Our sheep were not ready. Our management practices were not ready. Um, and then the drought came in 2007 and 2008, and we bit the bullet, like I said. Um, but again, our animals at that time, while we did get the goal of saving lambs and they did quite well out of it. Um, our animals and our practices were not ready to change to non-mulesing yet. Um, we pretty much got the lambs off at eight to 10 weeks because it was just a, a really um, crappy year in short. And like I said, while we did save animals, um, 
those used were black tags are in 2008 like i said i know that the black tags were a pain for us for fly strike for the following years um and yeah like i mentioned the animals were not ready and they proved to be challenging into the future um since they were challenging and we still wanted to head down the non-mules path we had to look into a genetic solution um we ended up like i said starting the practice about in 2008 of breeding towards um a planar animal but they were visual traits we had a class that come in um and we were aiming at pretty much a, a planar skin type um with a free growing wool that's how we started um by 2010 like i said uh animals were like our rams were able to be non-mused um and again in 2010 we started seeing the potential of asbvs to head us down this path um in a much stronger way so using asbvs and genetic traits um in particular we started focusing on fat muscle and staple length mainly staple length because staple length only comes when you've got a planar skin to actually grow it from um we chose to go fat and muscle a little bit as well just to help build the resilience of our animals um so that if they came into a an area of stress they would be able to contend with it a lot better um and be that stress of worms um a change in feed doesn't matter we're just looking to increase our resilience to stress um you can see underneath that further along we chose to um look into worm egg counts um breech wrinkle gain yielding fat and yielding eye um were the main traits that we were looking at unfortunately um for breech wrinkle there's no two breech wrinkles are the same you can have visually a very large breech wrinkle but it can be a really soft supple skin you can also have really um hard wrinkle but it doesn't actually appear to be much um each skin type breathes differently there doesn't really seem to be a silver bullet but all in all if you reduce your skin um, skin amount and reduce the wrinkle amount it um, definitely helps your animals but the big thing that we um we chose to focus on genetic wise ended up being dag um while dag is local to your environment um if an animal is daggy it could be due to worms it could be due to immune stress um a low condition score when lambing it could be due to diet or poor gut health there's a lot that can create the reason for an animal to be daggy but either way if you try and limit the factors above and you genetically select on dag you're selecting animals that are good with changing of diet are good with worm resistance are good with immune stress um, as soon as you stop breeding dag you stop breeding the environment for flies to live on the animal um, i've also attached a link which will go through the next couple of slides johan actually talked about this earlier on um, i find that if you're looking to start in this area it's a great place to start just for a reference point so it's just an understanding of what breach like the ASBVs for breach wrinkles are um, and what you're visually looking at. So because we've bred towards a planar animal, um, we haven't really had to contend with um, body wrinkle scores of five or breach wrinkle scores of five, that sort of thing, because we've been breeding it out over a period of time. But this just helps you visualize what your end goal is um, and the power of each trait be it scoring for dags, um, breech wrinkle, body wrinkle. Um, breech cover is another one that we're looking to breed towards in the future. And worm resistance, I tend to find if you're, like I said, breeding towards limiting dag, you'll naturally get a resistance at some point. Um, now, the question that most people have is, how has your management gone? Um, I have no, no fear in admitting our management was not up for the task back in 2008. We bit off a lot more than what we could chew. And um, 
we came up with a couple of issues around how to handle um, non-mules for the first time. But once we got around to 2016 and having another crack again, and definitely by 2019, we're a lot more confident in what we're doing and why we're doing it. So 2016 did have us a lot more confident in where our animals were at. And um, we definitely did choose to do our weathers again because they were the first animals that we could get up, get off, and in, in seven weeks because we were breeding a quicker growing animal as well. Um, so pretty much we didn't have to mules them because they weren't sticking around for a long, long term health. Um, we changed our management of how we do our lambs. So we pretty much weren't keeping weathers. Um, we did go towards the planar skins and that did increase our staple length and as such it changed us to needing to go to eight month shearing um, so we shear in february um, october and then in the following years june or july now we're not religiously eight months we might be seven and a half we might be six and a half like it's however it fits into our schedule but um, we found in doing that on certain years you will limit um, the requirement to crutch and the the real ideal there is if you can get down to six months shearing um, you are pretty much limiting your crutching and and going straight into a shearing instead um, like I said in in 2019 we're a lot more confident in our practices and that's probably due to we got an understanding of when we can use click um, as a management practice and instead of a crutch, especially over summer rains and pre-lambing our second year of um, our shearing, we're lambing down in essentially what is full wool for us. Um, so click is a really good management tool in that period to prevent fly strike to the U, U, um, U lambing stain that they receive. Um, we definitely learnt to manage DAG and breach wrinkle, but in particular DAG score, and we definitely manage um, condition score because the healthier the ewe is, the more robust she is and resilient. So we find that they can take on that stress easier. Um, and in particular, worm egg counts are your friend. Um, be proactive with your worm egg counts so you're ahead of the game in potential problems. Um, and all of the above ends up reducing our animal stress. Um, every now and again, we do take a hit on the chin. So because we're eight months shearing, uh, every second October that we're doing, um, we're essentially shearing our lambs with no wool on them. But it does help by shearing our lambs in October every single year. They're pretty much bare shorn for the summer period then. Um, and that has lowered our amount of fly strike over summer and lowered our reliance on um, chemicals, which long term is something that is definitely required. And once you get your management down pat, um, you then have the fun part of proving your practice. So like I said, 2019 is Saurus completely unmules. We don't no longer mules. We've still got some mules animals that will leave probably next year. Um, but right now, uh, for the last, geez, three, four years, yeah, we haven't been using anything. Um, so once you get to that point, you're trying to market your product, you've got to prove how you are unmusing or how you have ceased musing. Um, so the shift to non-mules was set to bring a financial gain back in 2008, 2010. Um, we struggled to see that initially. Um, we saw our non-mules use fetch a lower price um, because farmers didn't want to breed, um, didn't know how to manage them. Um, and we also saw our ram buyers, again, not want to buy a non-mules animal because they didn't know how to manage them and were fearful that they were going to have a higher um, fly risk. Um, once you get your breeding and management practices down pat, you find out that that's sort of false. You do have to be on top of your breeding objectives um, and you do have to be on top of your management practices, but um, it's all manageable in the long run. So after 2019, um, we've actually been aware of multiple schemes at the moment 
that allow us to prove that we're non-mules and have been for a, like a period of time now. Um, just this year, we decided to go into RWS, which is a responsible wool um, wool scheme um, for proof of our best practice. Um, we also get an audit based on our practices, so people come in and um, pretty much we have to prove that we're ceased musing. But other schemes that are out there as well are sustainable, um, and it's pretty much based on whatever the breeder wants to do. Um, the big thing though is if you are currently looking to non-mules and have got some non-mules um, wool, don't forget to declare it on your um, wool specie because unfortunately that is one of the least used ways of um, marketing your wool. So our lessons along the way, and these are probably the, the key things that um, makes it easier for people looking to start out. Your animals have to be fit for purpose. Um, like I said, back in 2008, our animals were not fit for purpose. We were not ready for this, um, even though we attempted. So definitely change your animal um, phenotypically before you start heading down like the don't just stop tomorrow and go cold turkey. Um, you're asking for um, management issues there. Um, so be fit for purpose, have a lower breech wrinkle, lower body wrinkle, low DAG score and a well-conditioned animal. Um, and that will set you up right from the beginning. If you can tick most of them off, you're already well on the, on the right track. Um, then crutching is still a tool. Um, it helps you alleviate your chemical burden, especially when it comes to click. Click is an amazing product, be that because we're eight, eight months shearing, we usually use Click Zin um, because it's got a shorter active period and it um, reduces our chemical laden on the wool. Um, and, but while Click is a great product, um, use it with caution and ideally, sort of best case scenario is managing to get to probably six months shearing, where you can take out a crutching and just go full shearing. But each, each breeder's objectives are different to themselves. Um, and then keep in mind market mentality. Um, the, the market indicators are finally starting to be strong um, in towards, if you can prove that you're sustainably ceased musing, um, yeah, the market's definitely there and the profits are definitely there to head this way. Um, consumer opinion is changing because education is getting out there on how to manage a non mule flock. Um, you do need a form of um, proof of practice if you actually want some market share. Um, but the biggest thing, no matter what, educate yourself on how to manage a non mules um, animal like days like today. Um, and you'll be well and truly on the right track. The biggest thing we have learned along the way though is definitely management. So flies still strike no matter what, but um, it tends to be from our failure to manage the animals correctly, not actually the animals necessarily being not fit for purpose now. Um, if we don't crutch them in time, you're upping your risk. If we don't click them in time, we're upping the risk. There'll be seasonal variations over summer if we get a high rainfall period with muggy conditions. If we haven't clicked them, we're upping their risk. Um, but their management practices that if we click on time or we shear on time or we crutch on time, we have no stress in that regard whatsoever. Um, if we do things on a timely manner, and we have our man management practices up on point. Um, yeah, it's definitely something that it, it has lowered our stress on our management practices towards the animal that we've got. Um, I think we're like going over the, the questions at the moment, and I'm pretty sure Emily Stretch will be the next speaker coming on, and we'll have questions after her. Is that right, Catherine? Yep, that's yep. it. Thank you. Awesome. Just take control of that.
So we'll hold the questions until after Liz, after Emily has done her presentation as well. Um, and we'll go through and they can um, both have a have a turn at answering the questions. Um, Thomas's contact details are there as well if you want to discuss further. Um, it's great that Tom and Emily are both so open to discussing um, their journeys and top tips for other people. So definitely if you've got questions, take them up on that offer. Um, so Emily um, farms with her family near Kojanup um, and they ceased mulesing in 2007. Um, so a bit of a different story to what um, Tom has done, um, but she will share some of the changes that they've made over the last 15 years. Um, again, she's got a Twitter handle and Instagram there, so she's very open about sharing um, what goes on on farm and is a great person to follow. Um, but feel free to get in touch with her as well if you want more information. I'll let Emily take over now. Thank you. Alrighty, let's go. All right, so you know I'm Emily. We farm in Kojanup, so we're southwest of Koj in a 550 to 600 mil rainfall zone. So it can be a little challenging. We run from Jarrah gravels down to very fly prone paper bike flats, which is a lot of fun. Um, we're anywhere between 40 and 60% sheep. Um, that fluctuates depending on whether we're putting more crop in or buying more weathers. It's all dependent upon the profit lines. But within that, we always keep um, around 5,500 breeding ewes. So we just fluctuate our dry numbers. Um, so sometimes we will buy in lines of mules leathers, um, which just top up our numbers, but we keep them separate when we shear and crutch for our species. And we're a family enterprise with three key employees and outside contractors. Um, we're a full merino enterprise, and that is partially Westerdale genetics. So all of our ewes are Westerdale genetics, and then we use Anderson rams over any of the ewes that we don't want to keep breeding for wool because they're too wrinkly. Um, so we use the Andersons to give us some wool and a quick turn off for meat for the weathers and such like. Let me find the next button. All right, so we see smilzing in 2007, which was 15 years ago, which feels like a long time ago. Um, we did exactly what Tom said don't do, which was go cold turkey, and I don't recommend it. Um, it was a lot of hard work. Um, so we stopped because of the previously mentioned fuss that came up in 2004 and the potential ban for mulesing in 2010. So we wanted to be on the front foot if it turned out that the government said, no, this is going to be illegal. Um, we didn't want to be chasing our tail. Um, that's why we did it. And once we stopped mulesing, none of us wanted to go back to it. It's not something any of us wanted to do. Um, all the tools we use in the next slides, you should start doing now. It is much easier for you to transition your genetics and your management now and then stop mulesing when you feel that you've got things under control. Um, yes, we had some heartbreaking flyaways. Um, we could have very easily gone back to mulesing because of those flyaways or because of the issues we had with seriously daggy sheep and contractors but we were all committed on farms. So it's going to be easier to transition if you know that everybody within your enterprise is on board with going non mills If you've got someone in there who's not happy with that decision, it could make it a lot harder for you. So the basis of our management on farm, we are February shearing for adults. April shearing for our weaners. So we keep our, we lamb in July and we hold our weaners over until April for that shearing so that we get a nice long um, sort of 15 micron wool clip, which is quite fun for us. Um, we crutch in August and September when we're lamb marking. We crutch our dryers in August if we can to try and get ahead of the dag and fly season. And then in October and November, we put a preventative click treatment on pretty much everything on the farm. This lets us get through harvest without 
constantly checking mobs of sheep because we're flat stick. We don't need to be chasing flies while we're trying to take a crop off. It's, yeah, not efficient. Um, I will say if you're using Creek, like Tom said, it's a brilliant tool. Don't half-ass your doses. If you're going to use it, use it properly. And do remember that if it says 18 to 24 weeks, if you're using this on non mule animals, it's most likely going to be 18 weeks, not 24. So time things for your shearing and crutching at the other end with the when that chemical is going to start tapering off. Um, at the moment, we only crutch once. Uh, we do toy with the idea of crutching twice, but how we fit that into our program is a little complex. Um, and currently our sheep staple length doesn't mean that we need to go to crutching twice, but we're borderline on that. So if you do have a long staple length, I would definitely consider crutching twice. Or like Tom said, if you can transition to shearing more times a year, then that might be a better way to go. So costs and benefits. Obviously, there are going to be some costs if you're doing a blanket treatment for flies where previously we were only doing a seasonal treatment. If it looked like we had summer rain and the incidence of fly strike was going to go up, we would have treated then. But now we do our blanket treatment. It's going to cost more. Um, crutching for us is about one and a half times the normal cost. But this is something we slowly come to by having open dialogue with our contractors. So I would encourage you to make sure that if you're going to think about going on mules, have a chat to your contractors beforehand. Be open with them. Make sure you communicate with them. We've always said to them, we want you to be able to make the same money in our sheep as you would be able to in mule sheep. So it's just sometimes our sheep fly as fast as a mule animal. Sometimes they don't. It all depends on the year. It depends on the dag. It depends on the crutcher as well. Um, so just be open and communicative is all I can stress there. Currently, we don't have any extra charges for shearing. Um, that may be because we have contractors who are really nice I don't know um, but again be open and communicative with them as well um, we do see a little bit extra cost in strategic drenching and worm egg counting for labour hours but in saying that with strategic drenching we get to a point where our adult weathers are only drenched once every 18 months in a high rainfall zone so the more we focus on worm egg counts and the more we focus on sheep that can handle a worm load, the less we have to spend on chemical intervention and labour hours to do so. So they go hand in hand. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. Last year in 700 mil rainfall, um, it was higher, that's for sure. But in a drier season for us, it's going to be a bit lower. Um, wool pricing and marketability. So, yeah, we're finally starting to see that there is a market indication that people are willing to pay more for the wool. We can't quantify exactly how much the premiums are, um, but we do see for sure that when the market is volatile, our wool moves before the mule's wool does. So from that point of view, we have more market access, which is fantastic. Um, accreditation schemes are going to cost you a bit of money, um, but they should also allow you to market yourself better into those wool markets and potentially meat markets, fingers crossed for the future. Uh, we use sustainable and that's really simple to get into in terms of you can be certified for using pain relief whilst mulesing and then you can jump to the next tier and say we've ceased mulesing now um, and they also have a higher tier for using pain relief and being non mules which is really cool. We're getting to a point where we can show the world that what we do is best practice. Right, so the tools that we use, and I'm just going to jump forwards one slide so you can see these images I've got here from our landmarking this year for breach cover and unfortunately the click covered up a little bit of um, the urine stain that you can see there. But if you have a look at the breach cover image on the bottom of that slide and then compare it back to that one, all of these are basically a what I would call a score five for breach cover. What we're finding is that the breach cover for us is not a sticking point in terms of fly strike. 
and it's not a sticking point for the contractors. The sticking point is how much wrinkle there is really close to the vulva there where they're trying to be as careful as possible. So it's about taking out as much of that wrinkle as you can. So the image on the left-hand side there is probably the closest to what I would consider acceptable. And the other two there, I'm pretty sure I stuck a tag in and said, no, thank you. Um, so when we manage worms and dags, I'm worm egg counting every two to three months, um, more frequently for our young sheep. So it kind of balances out um, at about the six hours per month of labour for the WEC because I do all of my own. Um, we drench resistance test every two years and I'm hoping to be able to do fly resistance testing as well more regularly. Um, it's a little harder to get hold of and to do, but we'd like to make sure that click is functioning properly. So make sure that your chemicals are actually doing what you need them to because if you go in and do a preventative drench because your worm egg count said you should, but you use a product that's not actually going to get you the effect that you require, it's going to be hard yards. And I cull on DAG whenever the majority of the mob is clean. So whenever our sheep come through the yards, we will be assessing them. And if all of them are DAGy, then obviously my management hasn't been up to scratch. If 5% of them are DAGy, those 5% will be identified with one of our cull tags. And when I say cull tag, that's what we call our mob that we put the meat rams over, the Anderson rams. So I'm not selling them. I'm putting them into a mob where I know where all of my risks are. Genetic selection and classing. So, yes, carrying cull tags whenever in the sheep yards. Also, whenever I'm treating fly in the paddock, I carry tags that identify those animals to make sure that they're sold off the farm. So if they've been struck, don't keep them. Get rid of them. That's, I've learned that much from Johan's presentations over the years. Um, our cull tags, we just do a very simple, we choose a colour from one of the years where, say, blue or green, where you can choose light blue or light green versus dark blue or dark green. We use a light green tag and that's our identifier for anything that we don't want to continue breeding wool sheep from. So the majority of our culling, classing, occurs on the landmarking cradle, as you can see here in these images. Um, I know someone sent through some questions earlier wanting to be able to see what the uh, scoring system looks like when it's not a cartoon. Um, the image on the left here, I would consider to be just over a one. There's still a tiny bit of a wrinkle around the tail there. The image on the right-hand side, possibly a three, but there's not a huge amount of wrinkle on the tail itself, so it might be just under that but that's me. So what I would say is when you're classing, always be as, um, what's the word? Consistent as possible. So if you've got one person who does the classing on the landmarking cradle every year, you're gonna get a more consistent result than if you swap, change, swap people each year. In saying that, if you can create a guideline where everybody knows exactly what they're looking for, then anybody on the enterprise should be able to class anything out at any point. So yes, we cull on breech wrinkle, breech stain, absolutely anything that is pissing on itself as a lamb, as a ewe lamb, will continue to do so and will be a problem for you. Don't keep it. Um, Dag scores we've covered, fly strike we've covered. Um, I also have a look at the face cover, anything that's muffled around the face and has wool coming in a long way towards the mouth and eyes. Um, yeah, they come out as well. They're a management issue for us when they get wool blind um, and also it's an indicator of your breech cover as well. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's more, but that's okay for now. Um, our ram selection now is different. We haven't actually, we've, we now use Anderson rams, which we didn't before. We still buy Westerdale rams, but what we buy from that shed is completely different to what we bought 15 years ago. Um, Anything that I see in a ram shed that has dags on it or has been crutched, nope, not buying it. Anything that I can identify tail wrinkle on as a ram in a ram sale, nope, not buying it. Um, and when we go to Anderson's, obviously we use the ASBVs um, and work really hard on bringing back things that can handle worms and handle it without getting daggy. In saying that, you're never going to remove DAG altogether. 
some sheep are going to have hypersensitive scours. All you can do in that scenario is identify those sheep and whether you sell them or put them in the high-risk mob or quite what you do is up to you. But just remember that sometimes your sheep are going to end up with dags and that's just part and parcel of the fact that they're sheep and they have all around the tail and they're shit. So don't beat yourself up if you get it wrong at some point. Um, Okie dokie. Top tips and lessons learned. Alter genetics first through ram selection and on-farm culling. I think everybody who's spoken so far has said make sure that you get your genetics to a point where you're comfortable with not milking first. Um, I can't stress this enough. Going cold turkey with what we what we stopped with was practically score five sheep for breed wrinkle, and it wasn't fun. Um, playing your sheep out as much as you possibly can. There's so much better genetics out there now than when we stopped. Um, aim for a worm and dag resistant sheep with clean, smooth breach. Like I said, we're not focusing too much on the breach cover at the moment because that would limit our numbers entirely. So identify one of one or two of the traits that you want to start working on, be it wrinkle, be it dag, be it worm resistance. Identify one or two and just start taking out the worst. You don't have to get rid of all your sheep in one go. That's We didn't do that. We put Dorsets over our crappy sheep. So we still had an income, but we knew where all of our risky sheep were. And now when we're culling, we're not culling out score five for wrinkle. We're culling out what I was showing before but with that two and a half to three. So we've come a long way in 15 years and we'll keep doing it. We keep classing every year. Be prepared for questions from your contractors. Don't be put off by the fact that some of them are not going to be happy with non-mill sheep. There are other contractors out there. At least I hope there are. It's hard at the moment. But, yeah, be open with them and don't be scared about the questions. Just make sure that you're well-informed and that they know that you're learning from Tom, from me, from Johan, from all those people about how you can do it well. Have other levers to pull on flies and dags. So if you find that you do end up with daggy sheep, have a system in place where you know that you can apply something like click or fly and lice or something that will allow the dag to lift off until you can get them crutched. We've done this in previous years. Um, if you find that your fly chemical has been washed out by rain like we did last year and all of a sudden it's not actually protecting the sheep, have a plan in place for what ha what you do when that happens. Just put in some contingency plans so that you know when shit hits the fan, this is what I'm going to do instead of getting to that point and going, oh, my God. <laughs> Don't be shy with culling. Be ruthless for faster gains. And like I said previously, if necessary for number of retention, put a meat ram over your cull or sell your crappy sheep and buy someone else's better shape. Um, there's multiple options out there for how you can keep your numbers up if that's what you need to do to be ruthless in getting your genetic gains. Don't be afraid to shift studs if that's the simplest way to get to the end goal. And if you need to do that, have some open conversations with your own stud because who knows, they might be thinking about going on meals themselves. And the people that you want to shift to, you have an open conversation with them as well because most people who breed sheep, they just want to help you get to where you want to go. And know which sheep are most at risk. Always check them first in a flyway. And if you're checking sheep and you don't have time to check all of your sheep that day or that week, always check that mob first. Um, I did have a couple of other notes that I wrote down. Uh, always go to your three joints on the tail. We had a contractor who shall not be named who docked too short with non mill sheep. And for the entirety of their lives on the farm, we were chasing prolapses and fly struck sheep. The, the sheep definitely need to be able to lift their tail to actually project urine and shit away from their body, particularly, obviously, for the youth. So don't dock too short. I think Karen mentioned it. If you need to, go a little bit longer. Um, sometimes we go to the fourth joint if the tail length doesn't cover the vulva to limit any cancers in that region further on in life. 
Um, and yeah, remember that the chemical times for things like Cooper Swine Life or Click or Vetrazen were probably tested on mill sheep. So be aware that the time frame that they protect for might be slightly less than you're expecting because you're giving it a higher burden to work with. Uh, I am trying to think if there's anything else that we have learnt along the way that you guys would really like to know about. Um, I guess I'll let you ask some questions. Um, next slide. Thanks, Emily and Tom. There is a few questions in the chat here. Tom, if you want to turn your camera back on again. Um, <clears throat> so, um, this was um, after Tom's presentation, but do you still tail strip ewes and what can be done to address buyer concern with unused rams and sheep, do you think? Um, no, like I said, in 2019, we ceased mulesing altogether, so we don't tail strip ewes or anything like that anymore. Um, it is just a clean cut across the back of the tail, um, very similar to what um, our first deep head speaker was saying where you can roll the hot knife a little bit over. Um, so that gives us a, a very minute leeway in that um, and works very similar to like the Tapari hot knife. Um, we found that quite effective. Um, the big thing um, when it comes to the like the musing part, or sorry, um, cease musing part, like Emily just said, you have to go and cover the vulva no matter what. So three joints or longer, um, and you'll find that the plan of your animal around the breech is as you progress that into um, your genetics, um, we no longer really crutch as such. We can now do a bunghole and find it quite easy. Um, if you go a shorter tail, that becomes an absolute nightmare to try and bunghole and clean up. As long as you've got a long tail, you can pretty much lay the tail flat and crutch straight over the top of it, um, which protects the vulva and everything. Um, and when it comes to unmules, rams or sheep or anything like that, the more we can educate people on how to manage um, practices around looking after the animals, the less scared they're going to be at actually going down this path um, and the simpler it's going to be. I think the biggest problem at the moment is people just don't know how to manage unmule stock. Um, so they're fearful of it and that's the, the biggest thing preventing them taking the step or buying them or buying the rams or, yeah. Um, if we can educate through processes like this on the different ways that you can um, manage those stock, it'll definitely be, yeah, worth it. Um, on top of that, Catherine, I think one of the other reasons that we're having trouble with the market is that our pricing indicators haven't trickled through to the rest of the market in terms of other farmers buying non-mules lines of sheep. There's not necessarily that benefit in the dollars for the wool or for if you were selling prime lamb or something like that, which hopefully is coming because that's what the public is starting to demand from us. So as the as the dollars change, farmers will pick up on it. Money talks. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, we've got another question here. It says, is it advisable to click at crutching and shearing as a preventative? What were you guys doing? Um, I'm happy to lead if you like. We would potentially, because we're eight months shearing and have gotten to that, um, for us, directly applying click straight after, number one, we can't use click um, because it's withholdings too long, like the, the original, it's withholdings too long, hence why we have to use Zin. Um, and then the next part is there's no point putting a product on um, directly after or the first, say, two weeks to, uh, sorry, probably first month after shearing. Um, because the shearing is is in essence a, um, a a chemical resistance in itself. Like it is a preventative, a preventative. method in itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so initially, straight after, probably not. But on the flip side, and this is a hard part, 
if it fits with your management and how you can best look after your sheep, 100% do it. So um, if you can't afford to bring your sheep in a month later or a fortnight later, do it when you can. And um, yeah, that's it's probably yep. the easiest way of looking at it. I would follow that, Tom, with saying yes. If the simplest option for you is to apply preventatively and that means that your sheep are going to be safe from fly strike, that's always going to be your best option. However, have a look at um, the time of year that there are actually going to be flies around. If you're in a zone where your soil temperatures are lower than the, I think it's 15 degrees for when green flies hatch, um, you potentially don't need to have that chemical out there. And the less we use it, the more effective it's going to be for the longer period of time. However, it's a chemical that is out there for us to use. So I would encourage you to have a look at your climate and have a look at the times where your high risk periods are. And I think Karen had a link there for Ag360, which would be really good at seeing where those peak periods are. And then time everything back to your um, wool handling intervals, your wool harvest intervals and that sort of thing. So there's a little bit of math involved in working out when you can use it and how effectively you can use it. Um, and I highly recommend trying to time your applications with something like Click so that as it hits it, so I think Click is 18 to 24 weeks. So I really hope I have that number right for everybody. Um, as it hits is 18 or 24 weeks, depending on your pressure load, you want to be potentially shearing or crutching at that point so that you're removing anything that's going to produce a fly population that might have a bit of resistance. Um, it's kind of how it works. It's a bit like tail cutting your long acting drenches. Thank you. Um, next one is what do your crutches and shearers think of unused animals? Ours actually, um, it's, it's probably bad. But ours don't have an issue at all. Uh, like I said, we bung all ourselves um, or we crutch ourselves depending on the, the season. But in regards to shearing, and we can do that because we're a smaller flock. Um, larger flocks will, would have to contend with um, contractors. When it comes to shearing, um, we have more complaints over the weight of the animals or the size of the animals than what we do, whether they're mules or unmules. Um, but the biggest thing, and I 100% agree with Emily, is just have a talk with your contractor. Um, if you keep that discussion open, um, you can always work out, hopefully, a best case scenario with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had an absolute hell of a time with contractors when we first stopped, but we weren't managing our DAGs properly. So it was almost like we were musing the sheep when they were adults. It wasn't pretty. Um, so if you can control your DAGs and have that conversation conversation with your contractors about the fact that you're working really hard to keep the DAG off and to do everything in a timely fashion and the younger crews that are out there are seeing more and more non mule sheep. So it's possibly we had more issue with the older generations of crutches who'd never really seen it before and went, well, why are you doing it? What's the purpose? And they weren't necessarily changing the gear or their technique the younger crews are definitely changing their gear and their technique and getting better at it and they're more amenable to it. Great. Um, we had a question around the percentage of wool now unused in WA and nationally. So um, the AWEX website does have the current statistics on the um, mulesing status at auction. Um, but I will say that adoption rates of um, or compliance rates of the NWD in WA are lower than the rest of the country as well. So um, that's something to consider when looking looking at that. Um, right, what else have we got here? Um, Emily, are you using rings on the tail? Not a hot knife. Uh, yes, we are using rings on the tail and it's one of those I can't decide whether one is better than the other. Both have a form of pain attached to them. At this point in time, we use green rings. It has, we're practically a bloodless operation on the land marking cradle. And for me, that seems like a good welfare practice. So yeah, we're green rings at the moment. 
And following on from that, do either of you use pain relief for tail docking castration? We use numb nuts for castration and looking to use a long acting as well in the future for the tail docking. I'm still not 100% sold on the numb nuts for the tail docking after seeing some of the epidural effects that can occur. Um, but that could be error in the way that I'm doing it as opposed to it being an actual problem. So I need to do a bit more upskilling and research on that side of things. Um, and we use, what is it, trisulfan um, on the, the tail or the wound area. Not that there really is much of one. Um, and we're looking into a long acting pain relief, be that um, a buccal jesic or something like that um, into the future. Right. Um, we do have a non mulesing related question here, but interested, do you use the Erivac vaccine? Um, that is an interesting question because since we've stopped mulesing, we see very little incidence of the, um, the arthritis that Erivac is used for. So we don't actually use it at all. And I don't remember the last time we did since we stopped mulesing. Um, incidence of arthritis, and incidence of cancers in our shape totally reduced for not mulesing. Um, and we do use Erivac at the moment, but I really question why, um, because pretty much mirroring exactly what Emily said, since we ceased mulesing, um, the risk of infection regarding the bacteria around like the, the wound site is a lot less. Um, and I think it was on Emily's photos with the type of um, cradle that she's using, um, and we use a very similar inline cradle. The animals get dropped on their feet once released from the cradle. So again, it's limiting the ability for the ground contact with the wound area initially um, or non-wound area at all. So we're limiting the ability for the the arthritis to form in the first place. So while we do use it, um, I think uh, uh, it, it, it feels more like a feel-good thing at the moment rather than an actual requirement. Thank you. Um, I think that's all that's on the chat. Jeff did make, Jeff Linden from AWI made the comment that um, he's sent through the AWI fly strike technical update that was held in August. Um, has also has some answers to some of these questions around the percentage of um, non mules merino and WA wool. So I can share those links as well, and also the adoption rates of the wool declarations, national wool declarations. Um, there was a couple of other questions um, again around classing. So do you do all your classing yourself, or do you have other people come in and help? class at any stage? Uh, we do most of our classing initially by ourselves, um, especially regarding DAG or any of the um, the harder hitting, so DAG, wrinkle, um, that's all taken out before we get to um, our classer. And then we actually have a sheep classer come in, post all of that and um, puts them into a breeding bracket in short. So um, we go to say a large plain animal that has the ability to um, be more resilient, robust, and then we have a wool type animal that we then end up crossing over each other. Um, but this then allows us to mate um, for an average animal across the both. So we're crossing a meat animal over a, a plain animal and um, getting a well-balanced animal in between. But the biggest thing, no matter what, um, and like Emily did mention, is when you're starting to, to class on DAG or wrinkle, best time to do it is when you're either on the crutching cradle, um, sorry, on the tailing cradle, um, or um, pretty much when there is a challenge in your season that DAG is pronounced. Um, if you've got a small percentage in your flock that is showing DAG and the rest are perfectly fine, um, they're probably on a truck going somewhere. Yeah, um, we do all of our own classing. I don't actually remember ever having a classer come in on the farm for any of our wool traits or anything like that, but we are avid sort of scientific minds here on the farm as a family farm, so we really enjoy being part of that 
So I would suggest if it's not something that you're feeling comfortable doing or you need someone to help you get the basics started and give you a bit of ground truthing, find someone that can help you learn the classing for the non-mule side of things so that you're not questioning, questioning yourself all the time. But I can't stress enough, I literally carry those green tags in my pocket whenever I'm in the sheep yard. We class lambs when we're on the landmarking cradle, we class at weaning. So if something, we just have a rattle on the stick and if things are going up the draft and one of us pushing up to see something we don't like, we'll just stick a rattle down the back of it and just take it off to one side. Um, so, yeah, we class at landmarking, weaning, definitely at hoggett stage when things are starting to present a little differently. Um, we do a pretty stringent uh, class for maiden ewes when they come off the board for anything to do with colour or conformity issues. Um, and then further down the track, if anything presents strangely in the mobs that we consider to be our good mobs, we just pull them straight out. Um, yeah, it's just about getting that headspace right where you go, this doesn't need to stay here just because it's part of that mob. Great. One more on um, what proportion of your flock do you think gets struck in any given year now? We're both Jeez, um, for numbers now. We're probably, <laughs> we're, we're probably lucky. Um, as long as our management practices are on point, we're getting minimal. Like you might get one or two um, if you're lucky in between a mob of 300 maybe or I don't know if it's even that. Like it, if we have um, a preventative measure like click on, we'll get none. Um, if we have crutched in the right period of time or shorn in the right period of time, again, none. If we have a dry season, pretty much none. Um, we might find some in our rams every now and again, just because they're um, like, and that's our breeding rams, um, because they choose to uh, muck around with each other. And um, that tends to leave stains that uh, flies tend to to sort of gravitate towards. But again, if you're switched on and you give them a quick application, a click prior to when they're going to be doing anything like that, um, you, you're going to see none. So if we fail on any one of those practices, so if for whatever reason we have shearers a little bit late, like um, when COVID first hit, that was a world of hurt to some degree because um, shearers were absolutely flooded. We could not get them on time. We had a two week window that we were trying to squeeze our ewe lambs into um, and we didn't manage to hit it. So suddenly we had a larger burden of DAG um, in a winter period without the ability to shear and that was a tick, tick, tick for, um, and we hadn't applied click because because we were too close to a shearing window. Um, so due to withholding, we, we could not actually use click. Um, our only option then was to rush in and um, crutch them, but we we're hoping not to do that because we should have been shearing. Um, so when everything lines up and your management practices are on point, um, we find no difference, increase or decrease in um, fly strike, probably less because we're onto it more. Whether that be a, a mules animal or not, um, our practices are there preventing the fly more so than, um, yeah, what we're actually doing. But if you miss that window a little bit, yeah, you're going to have to have those levers that Emily was saying to pull because, yeah, it can get hectic real quick. Yeah, so in Tom's scenario there, yeah, crutching was an option, but also I probably would have considered going in and jetting with something like Cooper's Fly and Life, which is only a seven-day withhold. Um, I'm not sure what the wool harvesting interval is on that. I think it's low. Um, just to give you that little breathing space, so that's a perfect example of why you need to just have those little contingency plans rolling in the back of your head and going, all right, so that's not happening. How am I going to deal with it? Um, our incidence of fly strike over summer, we run mobs of ewes up to 2,000 in a mob on stubbles and 
we might treat five or ten in that mob. Um, and again, that would generally be something that wasn't applied properly with click, or it would have been those ewes that had the really short tail, or they miss crutching. Um, if everything is managed properly, the incidence is nothing, like Tom said. Um, yeah, and Johan's research that he was talking about before, the susceptibility to fly strike, if they're susceptible, they're susceptible. It doesn't matter what else is going on. Um, so it's just about making sure that you have your prevention strategies, be it mechanical or chemical, timed correctly. And, yeah, sometimes as farmers it just doesn't work and you don't hit those goals and in that case, what do you leave us? Thank you both. Um, another one around, um, did you have any difficulties when you initially ceased mulesing around separating mules from non-mules until the entire flock was unmulesed? Um, that might be a better question for you, Tom, because you've done it more recently than we have. Um, but the weather lands that we have, they're obviously identifiable because we put a transaction tag in them. So for me, I would probably say put something in an ear that's easy to see down a draft. Um, for us, probably because we're a smaller flock, uh, we find it easier to manage. Um, and like I said, we've still got... Uh, what is it, five and six year old ewes that are on the tail end of, uh, like they're on still mules. Um, we haven't gotten released them yet. Um, they'll pretty much go next year. And then all the sheep we're running will be, um, yeah, cease mules. So when we do that, at the moment, as they get to about five or six years anyway, um, they go into our commercial line. Um, and they're pretty much a mob unto their own. So we run our together, um, and as it slowly increases in years, we'll usually run a flock of, say, three to four-year-olds, um, five to six-year-olds, and then ideally, once we really get up and going with our numbers again, um, we'll be able to bring that breeding um, circle down. But we've got the ability, especially with three different blocks, um, to run mules and unmules independent of each other. Um, so we don't have to draft them off before shearing um, and we can just run, uh, like I said, we have a really good um, understanding with our shearing contractor. So the class, uh, we're always talking with them. When they come in the shed, you've got a mob cut out um, and that's how we use it. Like it is a cutout between unmused wool and mules wool. Um, and they're really, yeah, really good to work with in that area. So um, to manage it, you're probably looking at if you're a large flock and you can't get away with um, splitting them up into individual mobs, you you usually have a year group. Um, so run them down a race, split off your year group, uh, year group on colour tag and then run them as an individual mob um, going through the shed. Talk with your contractor and communicate with your classer, and you should be able to hold a separate line. Um, otherwise, yeah, you might find it a little bit harder into the future. The biggest thing is it just comes down to management, and like Emily has been saying, keep on the ball with what's to come into the future. So you nearly have to be, if you're thinking about... Um, Shearing, you're working either from cease mules to mule sheep or mule sheep to cease mule sheep as you're running through the shed. Um, and it means that you can separate the wool as you go. Yeah, generally I would say do your mules animals last so that if you have to interlock something with your wool, you're not um, left with a ridiculously small amount of something that's mules that you really don't want to lump in with your non mules. Um, in saying that, we do when we share our wieners in terms of specifying mules or non-mules, um, we often end up putting them all together on one farm. Um, the number of bales that we get for some of our wiener stuff like locks or bellies or that sort of thing, they end up all being lumped in together as mules, um, but certified as pain relief mules. Um, 
So it just depends on the quantity of some of the bales that you get. The fleece will all stay separate, but some of those little little lines get thrown together. Great, thanks. And one last one, I think. Um, did you have any issues with timing of lambing or did you have to change anything with regard to that? Um, we didn't have to change our timing of lambing because it happened to already be geared for when our pastures were at their peak, um, which is mid-July, and that then put the ewes being crutched just as that fly season is peaking, which is ideal already. Um, so we already had that system in place, but it's certainly something I would encourage people to look at is have a look at your peak fly loads across the year and then see if you can gear the way that your farming system fits around that instead of making a rod for your own back and sticking with the system that doesn't allow you to easily manage that. The only other thing that I didn't mention that we do, which helps us control worm counts and DAG and all those other things, is deferring our pastures for as long as possible. If you can shorten the worm season, you're ahead of the game. And we saw more of a change probably from changing our shearing interval, but um, we're kind of, we're set to some degree in when we can lamb, um, mainly by the stud and when we can get AI in and dropping AI. So we're somewhat restricted in our movement in that regard. But fortunately for us, um, lambing interval has all fitted in with the eight months shearing and it kind of just works. Um, I know of other people that have found it more challenging, but um, I don't know why or how, but we've just got a, a sort of a practice at the moment that just everything seems to fit in and work. So the only time it does get a little bit squeaky is if seeding pushes maybe a little bit later, um, that will challenge our like docking time when we're actually tailing but aside from that um yeah it's not too much of an issue lovely thanks guys um i think you've provided some really great um lessons and obviously people were very interested in all the practical sort of um side of it so um we did have their contact details up there before but if you missed that feel free to email me and i can pass on the contact details for both of you. Um, they're both um, very keen to share sort of their lessons learned and those practical tips um, to help people wanting to make the transition. So thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Thanks for letting us present. No, pleasure. So our next presentation is um, a pre-recorded one um, because Georgia is away at the moment enjoying um, a well-earned break. Um, but Georgia is a consultant with uh, AgPro Management and they are managing um, an MLA-funded producer demonstration site um, in Western Australia. So uh, the producer demonstration site is all about supporting the shift to a non-mules um, enterprise. So I will just go into that and um, share that with you. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I can't be there in person. I'm uh, off enjoying the flies up north. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming along and being interested in non-mules enterprises. Uh, my name's Georgia Reed smith I work with AgPro Management, as Catherine's already mentioned. Uh, and I've been involved for the last three years with running uh, a MLA producer demonstration site looking at shifting to non-mules enterprises. So basically, these PDS sites are meant to act as demonstration sites. Uh, we use them as demonstration sites and meeting sites across the state. So we've got, I think, five or six groups ranging from um, up north down to Esperance. And basically all these producers come together. Um, you're welcome to be involved if you want to learn more. Um, come together to look at people who have been non-mused for years, people who are just making the transition, um, and other people who have made the transition in the past few years and are just trialling it out. Uh, we've also got some people who haven't transitioned um, but are looking at their genetics so that they can sort of start on that pathway. 
so that's that's what we're doing with these with this project. It's it's all about producers supporting other producers. Uh, we're bringing in experts such as Johan um, and hosts who have been doing it for years, such as Emily, uh, to to help share their ideas and help producers learn what they would need to do uh, if they want to go down this path. So it's all about uh, equipping producers with the knowledge, skills and confidence that if they want to start transitioning to non-mules, they can. So we've got a real mix of producers involved, which has been really, really interesting um, and a lot of different breeds of sheep and we're spread across a whole heap of different climatic zones. So we could probably say that we've covered everything, um, which has been a bit of a challenge when it comes to trying to help producers create a plan for uh, non-mules management. But basically we we say there's there's three stages. Um, you need to make sure that the genetics are right before you even consider shifting to non-mules. Um, I'm sure Johan uh, will, will cover all of this because uh, that's what he covered when he came along to our demonstration sites and spoke to our producers. Um, most of Western Australian sheep do already have uh, quite a plain body and plain breech, so we're in a really good situation to be able to make the move. Um, but it's just assessing your flock and knowing whether um, your genetics support that. And we've got some great genetic tools now um, with ASBVs and, you know, our worm egg counts um, with a lot of studs using them there. So there's a lot more to play with there. But making sure your genetics are right is number one. Um, and then number two, um, a bit more about climate and management. So we say number two is DAG control. This isn't what we were expecting when we first started the project. We didn't think it was going to be the main challenge. Um, but DAG control from worms and from feed. So we've been educating um, producers a lot about their different worm strategies. Um, and I know Emily's a big advocate of this one. She does a lot of um, worm egg counts. Uh, so basically making sure that that's all under control and you've got a, a really good strategy and management plan in place there. Um, strategic use of drenches, as well as making sure that they're not being overused and you're rotating your drench groups is something we've really been hammering home. Uh, and making sure that everyone's got access to drench test and drench check uh, and using the Parabos tool uh, for, I guess, helping you know when and how to drench properly, that one's been great. Um, and then we've been bringing in nutritionists and vets to have a chat about feed. Uh, so sometimes it's as simple as making sure that before you move your sheep onto lovely fresh pastures, um, particularly at the start of autumn, uh, that they've got a, a gut full of, of hay so they can't go out and gorge straight away. Um, so it's really simple things like that and yeah, just having a better understanding of, of everything that plays around in the gut and can lead to DAGs because, uh, as we know, DAGs are where the flies like to hang out and lay their eggs. So all about reducing that. Um, and then the third sort of killer uh, that we talk about is creating a management program for the year and reviewing it. So one size does not fit all which can make it quite hard when wanting to just uh, take a recipe and apply it on farm to start transitioning to non-mules. Uh, my husband's an agronomist and I like to say that my job is a lot harder because I don't have a recipe. So none of you can do exactly what Emily or Tom are doing uh, because it's not going to work for your enterprises. Everyone's completely different. They've got different time of lambing. They've got different challenges um, with flies. They've got different environmental factors. And the sheep are completely different. So you don't quite know what you're going to get. And your fly population is completely different from your neighbours as well. So you have different densities and challenges of fly and you have different levels of resistance as well. So that's something to remember. Uh, your flies are your own. Um, but the main that main point there is we try and help every producer basically create a management plan. So that's... Um, strategic husbandry time, so that's sometimes adding in a double crutch. Um, it's moving, say, crutching and shearing to make sure that um, you're covering that tough period. Um, it's perhaps changing when you're jetting or um, shedding or drenching. 
And it's also making sure that everyone knows what should be happening when and prioritising it. Um, and then if there's different challenges throughout the year, different seasons, because we all know that every season is different as well, being able to adapt and react. So we said that everyone needs to be on board in an enterprise. Um, say it's a classic family-run farm. You need mum, dad, the son or daughter that's come home and the workmen all on board because you need all eyes on the sheep when they're going past. You need everyone to know what the pasture is doing. You need, you need everyone to know what the flies are doing um, and you need everyone to be wanting to react when they need to. So that's sort of the, the key parts of the project. Um, we've also been bringing in wool brokers and agents to talk about different accreditation schemes. Uh, so sustainable um, and RWS. Uh, Emily's actually the expert on those two. She's done a lot of research, which she shared with a lot of our producers, um, and she can very easily answer a lot of questions there. So I'm just going to keep throwing her under the bus. Um, and we've been linking to other tools and resources that people can use, such as Parabus. But probably the real strength has been um, we've we've got a WhatsApp group. So even while I'm sitting here, I've had three questions pop up. So we've got about 90, I think it's 90 producers on here, the Non-Mules Network, um, and someone sharing an Espence Ram sale that they're at and what they've got there. Uh, someone's telling their ASBVs that they've just purchased. We've got pictures from people about their different breach wrinkle score. Uh, we've also got a lovely picture here of someone's marking and they've been talking about, um, you know, using the Tapari knife correctly. So if you cut straight when you're marking rather than doing a slight twist, it's still classified as non-mules. So that network has, that WhatsApp network has been really strong because it's sharing real-time data uh, and people are also sharing when they're having flies coming around. Uh, and it's it's just been a, a really really great strength and probably the most uh, unexpected and powerful outcome of this project. So if you want to get involved and uh, join our WhatsApp group and come along to some of our days, um, you can shoot me an email um, or contact um, my phone. Catherine's um, probably going to share those contacts. And, yeah, we, we'd love to, to have you guys involved because it's, it's all about uh, helping producers learn off other producers and like I said at the start, just really get that um, the knowledge and skills so that if you want to change or if you are forced to change, you're in a position that you can do it. Uh, unlike some of the scares we had back in, you know, the, the late 2000s where a lot of people uh, tried to do a unsupported overnight transition to non-mules enterprise where we hear a lot of the horror stories. So we're, we're trying to educate Everyone so that they're, they're equipped with everything they need uh, if they want to go down this track. So that's probably about it from me. So, Catherine, did you have any, any more questions that you wanted to ask? That's great. Thanks so that's much, great. Georgia. We really appreciate you coming along um, virtually and sharing that information with us about the PDS. Um, what are some of the, of the common sort of barriers, I guess, with um, people maybe looking at musing or have trialled music and mules, um, non mules sorry, and have um, gone back to music again? What sort of common themes are you seeing there? Um, so coming into the project, uh, when people sort of started, it was just that lack of knowledge and not knowing where to turn to for support. Um, so we sort of created an environment where there is that support and that knowledge and directing producers to tools that they can use. Um, it's also a little bit of people having been burnt in the past and not having an in-depth understanding of, uh, you know, what causes fly strike and how to minimise that. Um, and I guess there's also the perception that it's quite costly, um, but that, again, depends on your individual enterprise. So we have, we have some producers that haven't had to do any additional husbandry at all. Uh, and then we've had some that have had to, you know, double crutch um, every year. We've got some that have to double crutch on bad daggy years. 
it's it's really it's really a, a real mix. Um, but there's also people that uh, you know are scared that they'd have to change overnight, and they're not planning on changing until they're forced to. But they they just want to know that they've they've got that those skills if they do have to go ahead, so that there's no uh, there's no welfare issues. And yeah, we we are seeing a fair few people wanting wanting to shift because they're not liking the the welfare um, I guess associations with uh, music. Um, and we've also seen a lot more people jumping on board as uh, pain relief has has come in and the uptake of pain relief. Uh, and that's that's also been a a really good news story um, that people have been sharing as well as the results they're seeing from the use of pain relief on the cradle with the healing times. Did that did that sort of answer your question? I sort of went off on a tangent there. No, no, that was good. Yeah. Thank you. And can you let us know where where are the locations that you've got um, each of these sites? So originally we only had six sort of host sites and they were producers uh, that had transitioned to non-mills uh, a while ago and they were meant to be the, the, the hosts that would help sort of uh, educate and show the other producers, I guess, an example of how to run a non-mills enterprise. What's happened is everyone who's involved has now sort of become a host site. So we'll go to different sites uh, throughout the year um, so every sort of key location, which I'll run through in a second, uh, we have two to three meetings a year in that location. And we usually go to a different producer each time. So sometimes um, we'll be at the producer that's been non mills for 10 years. Uh, sometimes we'll be at a producer who stopped millsing last year and wants the entire group to come along and have a look at their, at their unmules targets um, or help them assess on the cradle, whether they should cull based on dags or wrinkle. Um, it's, it's a real mix, but basically we, we're around um, Pindley. So our main host site there is the Ridgefield Farm, the UWA Research Farm. Um, we work quite closely with the A Sheep Group. So we've got sites down in Esperance. Um, we've got a sort of hub around uh, Koji and Boyout Brook. Uh, and then we've got another group in, Wooden Nilling, and I am forgetting a group right now. Um, I will let you know that one, Catherine. Sorry. I want to Thanks, say wager, but I don't think Thanks. that's right. <laughs> Put you on the spot with all of these things. Are there any other sort of um, common themes or things that you didn't expect to come out of the project that you guys are um, hearing? Uh, well, like I said before, we didn't quite expect to have so much of a focus on DAG control. Uh, and the other thing is we thought that the genetic understanding of fly strike was, uh, I guess, sort of basic, but Johan can explain that a fair bit more. He's actually changed a lot of people's minds about when and how they should be culling uh, and the different traits to be focusing on there. Um, his biggest one was, well, you can't actually cull anything until it's been challenged. So you need to hold on to it until it's an adult, which sort of goes against what a lot of us do, you know, with culling on the cradle. Um, but Johan can, can definitely fill everyone in on that one. Um, and I guess, to be honest, we didn't expect to have as many producers involved as have been. Uh, we've, we've just seen that there's, there's just this thirst for, for knowledge, uh, which we weren't expecting. We thought that this was something that, yeah, a lot of producers were interested in. Um, it's a five-year project, and I think we reached our producer engagement targets within the first two years. So we're currently in, in the third year, uh, and, yeah, we're, we're hitting the ball out of the park with that one. So you guys all want to learn about it, and I guess there's not really that many resources out there. Although if you do want um, a very interesting read, uh, Jeff Linden did a fantastic report through AWI uh, looking at different properties that had ceased mulesing. And I think if you just Google Jeff Linden non-mules AWI, it pops up. 
and that's that's a fascinating read. It's just a whole heap of different producer case studies. That's awesome. Thanks, Georgia. I will make sure that your um, details are up on the website when we um, publish this as well um, and make sure that everyone on the webinar can get access to it. So hopefully you'll get some more people come through and want to join in um, with your project. But it sounds like there's some really exciting things happening and lots of um, producer learning going on there. And I think that's one of the best ways people to learn. They need to be able to see and touch and feel and um, do stuff in person. So that's great. Thank you so much for um, taking the time to record this with us today um, and we will be in touch soon. Thank Cheers. You. I've just re I've just remembered where our other two sites are. Sorry. Um, one is in sort of more at Myling and the other one's down at Borden. Um, and I've just had another text come through that's actually reminded me that in the last few weeks we've started creating a list of uh, non-mule studs. So if anyone knows of uh, studs that either don't mules or have genetics that really do support non-mulesing, um, yeah, get in touch because we're trying to compile that for the entire industry because at the moment you have to go through every single stud record to, to try and find that. So, yeah, thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you, Georgia. That sounds like an absolutely great resource to have. That's um, great that you're compiling that. And thank you so much for your time today. Cheers. Thanks, Catherine. Emily's been involved with the um, with the PDS that um, Georgia is running. So um, be happy for you to share anything that you like there, Emily. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that all of those groups that are running, they are so open-minded. So if you're on the fence about maybe reaching out and jumping in on one of them, um, there's literally no stupid question. And it is a great brainstorming between lots of different people who have lots of different farming systems and different climates. So definitely a great resource. And if anyone's got any questions, I can try and answer them. Otherwise, I'm sure Catherine can refer your questions through to Georgia. Our next speaker is Jeff Linden from AWI. Um, Jeff's come back in, but you did actually get a mention in Georgia's um, presentation there um, around the um, planning for a non mules merino enterprise. So Jeff's the uh, program manager for genetics and animal welfare advocacy with AWI based in Sydney. Um, so Jeff will share um, some of the work that AWI has done in their fly strike extension program. And we'll also briefly touch on some of the um, AWI investment that's gone into research around fly strike. I will, uh, you can take over that presentation now, Jeff, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, it's, um, it's been a great uh, webinar. Um, so um, congratulations. Um, my job here is just to talk about some of the extension that AWI is doing in this area and very quickly a slide at the end which is is around the ongoing R&D that um, AWI continues to do in this space. So there's a team of three of us, myself, Bridget and, and Emily that are uh, heading up the, the R, RD and E with, with the fly strike. Um, at, at the moment, our extension program um, is based around a series of tools and resources, um, and then also some workshops and advisor um, coaching and support that we're developing up. So that's sort of the, the macro overview of, of uh, the extension program. Specifically, the first bit is about um, its fly time and its tools and resources, and it's up on the website, as you can see there, it's fly time, and it's around information leading up to um, high-risk fly strike periods and, and treating fly strike. So those resources are up on the, up on the website. Um, Demystify um, is a specific program around chemical resistance. This is a greater problem in the eastern states in Australia, than the others, but it's it, it's a constant problem, irrespective of whether it's a drench or it's a lice treatment or it's a fly fly treatment. Um, and there's a series of of tools that we have here 
Um, you can see here there's a, a wheel um, and here you can select what chemical you used for lice and previous fly treatments and there you can help try and uh, improve the, the chemical rotation. Um, and here's a list of, of information also around the um, timing of treatments and the withholding periods and, and what the actives are for. So this is all part of the, the materials in the Mr. Fly. And there's also a series then of, of ag facts that also uh, specifically relating about, you know, trying to delay resistance for as long as possible. Again, mostly this issue has been in the Eastern States and the current actives are, are very effective in, in the West, but it, but it is an emerging problem in the Eastern as a constant threat to any chemical. Um, the third part of um, uh, some of these tools and workshops is, is Simplify. Uh, Simplify is a one day workshop and it's really around developing a property fly strike management plan. Um, these workshops uh, have been released. Um, they were only uh, started uh, three or four months ago, but the contact for Western Australia is the sheep's back. So if you uh, uh, are interested to have uh, one of these workshops, um, the sheep's back is, is the contact there. The next uh, workshop that we're, we're looking at, that we're developing, we're actually piloting this at the moment, is a one day workshop to increase the reliance on breeding, on the breeding option control fly strike. So it's really looking to say, you know, can we increase, or well, we can, it's about how to go about it, increase the reliance on breeding to, to reduce the incident the, or the need for crutching and um, reduce the reliance on chemical and, and reduce, reduce the reliance on, on mulesing and, and to reduce the reliance on the size of the mulesing. So classify the one day workshop it's being piloted on the moment at the moment and will be available also through Sheep's Back um, in Western Australia or through the, the state extension networks. Um, and um, so that will be coming near you in, in the near future. What we're also looking to do is have a one day and this is we're in the planning phase of this at the moment is to have a one day workshop and it is specifically around developing a property plan to go non mules So all of the, the, the or previous extension programs that are, or um, tactics that I've been talking about is really for everyone, but Stratify is specifically for those producers looking to go non-mules or who have gone non-mules and are looking to reevaluate their property property plan. Um, and then the final stage in, in the extension program um, is what we're calling Amplify, um, and that will be a series of um, a process of workshops and whatever where we'd be looking to train accredited advisors um, for a long term use by individual wool growers to get consultants um, in over a period of time to help them um, move to a non mules enterprise and to help also help them to help all, all wool growers um, reduce the risk of, of fly strike. Um, part of the issue that we have um, is some years we could have three or four years of, of relatively low fly strike risk followed by two years of high fly strike risk. And so at times we need to set up longer term type extension programs um, rather than uh, a little bit more like well, where we've got with L10, which is a group of producers uh, meeting for six meetings over one or two years. Um, sometimes they could be years with low, low fly strike risk. So the whole part of Amplify is to train these uh, advisors up uh, and they're out there for the long term and on a, on a user pays, pays basis. And so that's under the early development at the moment. Um, but clearly what we're also wanting to do is integrate these extension, the fly strike extension programs in with uh, the other existing programs that we have as you can see here on this slide, um, because there's a lot of dovetailing in around property planning and classing of animals. So it's um, it's obviously got to be interrelated in with the other extension packages that we're doing. And Paraboss has also been mentioned. Um, it's a great resource that's up on the website 
Um, and uh, it, there's a lot of information also here on Parabos and, and the extension, fly strike extension programs rely here heavily on this, the, the Parabos resource. So Parabos um, uh, provides monthly webinars. There's some decision tools there. Um, also has a one day workshop on development. There's newsletters and there's a range of um, producer events and also um, QA uh, information there about where it counts, counts and the advisor, ship advisor certificate. So there's a range of, of resources there and information up on that Pirate Boss website. Megan Rogers is, is the contact there, um, uh, but it's also paraboss.com.au is the website to get hold of there. Um, we also have um, the plan, prepare and conduct best welfare um, practice landmarking guidelines. So it's also there up on the website. Um, and so that is for to get the best practice mules in for those who are still needing to mules to reduce the risk of, of fly stock in their sheep to for you know lifetime welfare reasons. And so that's a resource there. And then there's also some um, e-learning um, options coming that will also be up on the AWI website. Um, also up on the AWI website was this booklet, Planning for a Non-Mules Merino Enterprise, and it was largely came out of a, um, a survey maybe five or six years ago that I conducted, um, and it's a lot of the learnings, mostly of the um, uh, producers who were able to successfully stop, but some also stopped, then went back mulesing and then and then ceased again. So it's a it's a range of of responses and the key learning um, uh, items that that those people I surveyed um, highlighted to me um, in in that process. Um, the AWI Grower Extension Networks are an important contact for um, extension in general, um, but specifically these. Um, the AWI fly strike extension um, programs that, that are being rolled out uh, now uh, and into next year. Um, Catherine suggested that I also add to this um, some of the ongoing R&D that, that AWI has done. Um, clearly there was a lot of the R&D that Johan has, has highlighted. Um, there has been the assistance to get um, analgesics um, and anaesthetics in onto the market. So they be first became available in, in 2006. Um, and so there's been some rapid adoption uh, of those um, uh, products, which, which has been great. In, in terms of where we're going to from here um, in the R&D program, there's the vaccine development um, with the CSIRO and the University of Melbourne. Now this is a it's a long term, it's a high risk project, but there have been some recent advances in vaccine technology and there has been some encouraging results uh, in the early, early years of this work. And so we're continuing with that. Um, there is a sterile, sterile fly technique uh, project that SADI um, is commencing with assistance from MLA. Um, and AWI is also um, will be involved in that, and that's trying to release sterile flies. It's principally targeting um, Kangaroo Island to begin with. Now, this has been tried, you know, in the 80s and 90s um, in, in Australia with the, the blowfly. It's also been tried with other species overseas, um, but there has been some advances in this area um, such that it's worthy to, to give it another, another go. Um, with the increasing resistance to a lot of these, to the, a lot of the effective um, chemicals that we've had for fly strike control, um, we are doing a, you know, a fair bit of um, studying into modelling of how chemical resistance is created. We've done a fair bit of work in the fly genome to see um, what the fly genome can tell us about how chemical resistance emerges in the, in with the fly, um, and so that's ongoing work, looking at monitoring and surveillance, and also modelling in in this area. Um, while the there are 
some actives on the market now for castration tail docking and and mulesing. Um, we're forever looking at new and novel um, actives and, and also new application methods to um, increase the level of protection and assistance um, that these, the pain relief um, actives provide. Um, so that's a, a constant search for those. There are limitations about what would be is, is possible to register in this area. Anyway, um, we're looking to see if we can improve the current actives that we have at the moment. What we're also looking to do is, is to create ASBVs for urine stain um, and faecal consistency. So a lot of the work that Johan and Jen Smith did um, and that also came out of SIRE evaluation and of MLA um, R&D flocks um, created the ASBVs for um, wrinkle and uh, cover and wool colour and DAGs and, and they were released, were released in, in late 2009. Now we're also looking to continue that, that for urine stain and faecal consistency. We're also looking as a bit about that Johan led to is about how we can use genomics um, to assist us to breed fly strike resistance. We know there's no major genes of, of immediate or, or large effect and then it's going to be a single step type operation to uh, where we combine information with the genomics and also the phenotypic information that we have to give us an indicator of, of fly strike resistance. Um, so we are looking to see how we can set up um, a reference flock whereby we can um, better utilise the genomic information that we have. Now, overwhelmingly, the easy yards are to reduce um, wrinkle and reduce dag and reduce stain, uh, cover and then colour. Um, also, in terms of body strike, it's around reducing fleece rot um, and wool colour um, and, and then also breeding poles because the poles have less um, pole strike that, than hornies. Um, but there's a range of things there um, that we're, we're looking at. Um, about how genomics might be able to help us with both breed strike and, and body strike. Um, so um, also MLA is looking to have some welfare enhanced indexes that will be released in April next year. Um, and that will be able to bring some of these welfare traits into the indexes. And there's also a fair bit of uh, monitoring of, of on-farm practices and promoting all of the best practices. Um, and we're doing that with, with AWEX through the NWD and, and also with MLA. So that's a, that's a sort of a quick overview of, of the RDNE that we're, is, is continuing at the moment. Um, and uh, so that brings me to the end. So maybe over to questions, Catherine. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll just take control. Um, yeah, I don't. Has anyone got any questions they want to put in the chat? We are coming to the end of the webinar now. So if you've got any questions for Jeff or any questions for any of the other presenters, um, please um, type them into the chat. There was a couple that were um, sent through before um, during registration that mm, you might want to have a go at Jeff. Um, do you have um, any idea how do you envi how do you envisage traditional merino breeders making the shift to non-mulesing? Um, well I think th there's a there's a range of of ways that I think all breeders are transitioning. Um, I think there's uh, there's been a significant shift over the last 30 years uh, for all ram breeders to um, breed planar animals. Uh, there's been a long-term trend there. I think it's initially started um, with the when the um, prime lamb, um, the prices for prime lambs started to increase, and so there was a shift to breed a merino that was more suited as a prime lamb dam. 
So that started the trend. And then, you know, since the 2000s, um, there's been obviously the increasing uh, need to breed merinos that were more naturally more resistant. So that, that's happening. Um, a lot of these um, indicator traits, which is of DAG or wrinkle um, or stain, are very visual traits. You don't necessarily need ASBVs for them. You can class and cull on them. Um, and then also breed again for the, for productivity as well. But because some of these are antagonistic traits, um, uh, sometimes it it um, it takes a little while where to keep uh, breeding for profitability and also for fly strike resistance. So I I think uh, largely across the board, you know, the vast majority of ram breeders are are heading in this direction. All right, thank you. Um, and we also uh, probably a bit more of a, a comment regarding the um, accreditation procedures um, and industry standards. Um, would you like to make any comment around that? They're not. Um, so they're suggesting use sustainable as the industry standard accreditation platform um, and making the NWD document compulsory. Um. So there's a range of QA um, schemes that are available. I, I think it's it's headed to almost around 20 uh, are currently available, um, and a lot of that is um, growers can pick and choose which schemes that they that suits them, and they they get involved at in, and it's very much a grower choice as to which scheme they do get involved in. The, the NWD has been around since around 2008 um, and there's been a significant uptake um, in the, the new musing section that, that started in 2008 in the NWD. And so there's been significant adoption. Um, now there can be, you know, there's room for, for greater adoption. I think it's to about 25% of the wool is not declared. Um, the market signals in the last couple of years have shown there to be a, a discount um, if you don't declare. So there's there's clearly a commercial interest um, in growers to declaring. Um, so look, I think it really is up to the growers to, to pick and choose which um, QA scheme best suits them, their sheep, um, their environment, um, and their and their wool type. Thanks, Jeff. Has anyone else got any other questions for Jeff and any of the work that AWI is doing? Um, there's probably a couple of other um, questions. Maybe if everyone wants to turn their cameras back on that we're presenting, um, and whoever wants can have a have a crack. Um, but we had one question submitted. What do I change in order to start next year? Who wants I to have a go at that? If I ever go first, uh, the first thing is to sit down and have a plan. Just don't stop. Um, get some advice from uh, trusted advisors uh, and work the plan and get the plan right. Just don't stop. Yeah, I would second that. I would say if you want to stop next year, the first thing you've got to do is gear your system to allow you to manage it properly. So if your system's not geared right, it's going to be painful for you, the sheep, your employees, the contractors, everyone. So just like like Jess said, make that plan for your entire 12 months. And I can vouch exactly the same. Make sure you got a plan. Um, and if it's something that you want to do, get a good group of people around you um, and a great example would be that WhatsApp group or that um, Georgia was talking about. Just get a good team around you with a lot of experience in the area and um, make a good plan to get yourself forward. Yep, and I'll agree with that. Um, I, you know, know your enemy, come up with a plan. Um, don't be afraid to try. Assess how it went in your first year, and it's okay if some of it doesn't work. 
um, look at what you can change for next year and have another crack at it. Absolutely. We're still changing things now and we've been doing it for 15 yep. years. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Sounds like you guys are all singing from the same hymn sheet. It's great. Um, and maybe one other's uh, one other for um, you guys, Tom and Emily. Um, what do you think was the hardest obstacle to overcome in the transition to non mules Probably the initial start. Like um, you're doing a practice that has been done for so long, it's like nearly generationally engraved in in our management practices. Um, and when you haven't got like when we started back in 08, um, why we probably failed is we didn't have that support around us at the time. Um, and the market indicators weren't there, that sort of thing, where if we had a, had educational support like this around us, we had people to turn to, um, the decision might have been easier. But um, I think the biggest thing that prevents us is just that decision to start, decision to make a change and being confident with our ability to follow through with it. Yeah, I think because when we stopped, we went to trialling the occlusion clips. So we didn't just stop, stop. We were still using something that was going to uh, modify the breach to a degree. So for us, that wasn't quite the sticking point. For us, I think it was we stopped at such an early point that the hardest part was the perception from everybody around us, our neighbours, the contractors. Um, we were constantly copying flack from people in the industry going, well, what on earth are you doing that for? Like, that that just looks stupid. And it did look stupid because we did it without changing our genetics first. So that was probably the hardest point for us, which I guess drives home making sure you're ready to make that change. But equally, if you want to start next year, there is no better time to start than as soon as you're ready to do it. Thank you, guys. And on the flip side too, was there something when you stopped mulesing that you thought would be a huge issue but didn't end up being as much of an issue? Um, probably for us, I thought um, we would have to go absolutely nuts on crutching. Um, well, I, I thought that was going to become a, a huge management tool um, I don't ex exactly like swinging off the end of a handpiece, so um, that was one of my fears. But like I said in my presentation, um, if we get the tail length right all, and we get our management practices right, all we have to do now at worst is pretty much a bunghole, um, which is just cleaning up directly around the tail. And um, it's nearly... Yeah, when you get the technique, it's nearly just as simple as a crutch anyway, so or quicker. Um, so the thing that I was scared of hasn't actually sort of come to fruition. And as long as your genetics are right and your breeding and management's correct, um, yeah, it's something that you can get away with. I think one of the things we weren't expecting to happen through all of our DAG control, we've actually managed to maintain our sheep in a better condition score all year round. There's way less fluctuation because we're trying to keep the DAGs off. We're keeping the worms out, which is keeping the nutrition right for the sheep all year, which is something we should be trying to do anyway. But it was just one of those extra little lifts that has changed our wool cut percentage, actually, which is pretty cool. I've probably got to add on to that because it is something like our management practices have gotten so much better since we've like it's something that you have to be onto, and because you're onto it, you're always progressive. You're always um, being proactive in managing your livestock, and like Emily said, we've noticed that the livestock are healthier more often, and the stresses and um, that sort of they're potentially not there in the first place because we're already looking after the animals correctly. 
And I will say, Catherine, one of the flip sides to that is one of the things we didn't expect is that subconsciously, I think we've actually dropped our stocking rate a little bit because it removes that risk when we do have something spike in terms of worms. Um, the sheep aren't too close to the wind in terms of their nutrition to begin with. Um, and that's something that we're now playing with in our enterprise to see how far further we can push it back towards the stuffing rates we used to have. So we should be able to punch 14 DSE here. Um, and at the moment, we're averaging for the ewes around 10 and for the weathers around 12. Um, so we're just kind of working out how that all works. Great. And solid advice for anyone um, in those sort of, in making that transition. I think um, it's come through pretty loud and clear, um, planning, 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 um, genetics and getting getting your management spot on and being on the ball. Um, John and Johan, did you have anything else you wanted to add before, or anyone for that matter, before we wrap up? I don't think we've got any other questions in the chat. Final words from anyone? I can't know. I, I think it was very well done by the uh, the industry, the contribution they made and say how they've handled these uh, uh, the, the, the sheep mops and the trans uh, going over to non mulesing. I think that that covered a lot of ground. So it was well done. Lovely. Thank you, Johan. And in my case, maybe just a question uh, in terms of the Bigger picture in terms of the customs and clean and green. Um, can can we see any advancement there in Europe? You know, at the processes and so forth. You no. Know? I think we're slowly seeing that in terms of the wool marketing. Um, the the dollars are starting to reflect what the EU wants us to do, but it is a slow a slow change. I think the market signals, um, as seen by the premium and discounts on the NWD, really are reflecting um, the supply chain demands and and, and needs, um, and they're making it fairly fairly clear in terms of the premiums. Um, and, a, and a lot of the ones where AWEX, they're, they're the average premiums over the years. Sometimes the premiums can fluctuate much more um uh, and and the the upside is is very much there that's greater actually than than the average premiums over over the year and clearly also if you don't fill out the nwd there's a discount being involved so i think the supply chain's making it very very clear um and the and the premiums are there to be seen Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks to all of our presenters today for putting the time and effort into coming along. And thanks to all of our attendees who have had stayed online for um, this long webinar. Um, it has been recorded and will be available on our um, Ag Department DPIRD website um, afterwards. I will send a link to everyone who has registered to let them know when it's available on the website. Um, but I'd like to thank um, you guys as presenters again for um, taking the time and effort to be here today. Um, thanks very much, everyone. My contact details um, are there. So Catherine.davies at deeper.wa.gov.au. Um, if you want to get in touch with any of the presenters, um, feel free to shoot me an email. And if you missed it, on the slides, I can send you their contact details or um, wait for the recording to be up online. Thanks again. We'll leave it there.